seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, I call to order uh, this session of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Our first order of business is to enter into executive session. Um, in accordance with open meeting law, uh, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A, pursuant to Purpose 2, to conduct collective bargaining sessions with APAA, and Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, uh, Hootstein, because the chair finds that an open meeting may have detrimental effect in the litigation position of the committee, uh, and the chair does so find and moves the motion. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. This is a roll call vote. Uh, we'll start down on that end. Cassidy's an aye. Sullivan, aye. Demling, aye. Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Nakajima, aye. Gosensky, aye. We are therefore now in executive session. We will return to uh, the meeting at the conclusion of the executive session. All right, so I'm gonna return the regional meeting back to order, it's like 7.23 or so. Um, for those of you in the public, the reason I'm calling the committee back to order is that the first item of business in the open session is to reorganize the regional school committee. This occurs be when um, there's been elections in the towns, and at this point, all four towns have had their elections uh, and have had committee meetings since then to appoint members. And so we have Ms. Cassinson, who's a new member to the region, uh, with us tonight. And my only role will be to officiate the election of a regional school committee chair, and I'll be then gladly hand the placard and the gavel over to whoever that might be. So do we have any nominations for chair of the regional committee? Chair. Do we have a second? Second. And would you be amenable to that? Sure. Any other nominations for chair? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of Mr. Nakajima becoming the regional chair, say aye. Or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Against? Abstentions? I guess I'm abstaining. Okay. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Right, what else are we doing? We're doing a vice chair. Yeah. And a secretary or no? Uh, at the regional level, um, there's no. I'm sorry, I should be I didn't think so. I, no, I didn't think so. I was just confirming. Have a, uh, yeah. In my mind. So it was. Yes. At the regional level, it's been customary for the uh, region to um, acknowledge that Ms. Smith Smolin will take on the true secretarial tasks related yes. to it. She's not here tonight, um, and I can, um, but I think we could either hold on that vote or we could do that the next time. It's, it's different than at the Amherst and the Pelham School Committee where the secretary is a member okay. of the committee. Why don't we do that? Maybe we'll hold on it. Yeah. So we then will entertain nominations for a vice chair. Yes. Um, I'd like to nominate Audra Gosensky for a vice chair. Second. Second. Are there further nominations? Are you willing to accept the nomination? Yes. <laughs> Should have asked that first. <laughs> okay, seeing no more, we'll close the nominations. Um, all those in favor of Audra Gosensky as vice chair, uh, raise your hand signifying aye. Nay? Abstentions? One abstention, so congratulations to you. Uh, so, um, um, I mean, I know there's a lot of topics tonight. Subcommittees are in the packet, yeah. um, but we certainly can do that perhaps at a different time. We're totally doing that at a different point. Okay. I wanted a copy of the letter. I'm sorry? The thing. You said you have le a le oh, letter. I, um, I think that item number three on the agenda. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're of course. Before that. I'm, sorry. I'm totally sorry. I apologize. So uh, seeing the presence of a quorum for the Amherst School Committee, uh, call the meeting to order at uh, 7.25 p.m. And this meeting, um, this committee has been called to order because it, this is an issue or several issues actually that uh, impact the Amherst Elementary Schools as well. So that's why we are having a joint committee uh, meeting tonight. Great. Let me handle the next, no, next part of it. Okay. Um, so before we go into um, uh, announcements of public comment, um, we uh, had we became aware we got we saw in the Boston Globe and I don't know where else it was shared around um, a, a superior court decision in Eastern Massachusetts uh, affecting the Natick School Committee 
and the Natick School Committee had been uh, sued um, because of the uh, public comment um, policy that they had, and the Superior Court uh, handed down an injunction uh, against the um, uh, school committee in Natick. Um, they, they laid out, essentially, there were some facts around, from what we saw, some facts around how uh, Natick had both organized itself as well as also um, implemented its um, public comment policy that are, at least according to our attorney, um, materially or substantially different than what we were doing here uh, in Amherst, uh, Pelham Regional School Committee. Um, but there were also some common elements, particularly um, the a lot of school committees across the Commonwealth adopt the model announcement and public comment um, policy from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. So there's a template that presumably at some point was vetted um, by attorneys that a number of school committees across the Commonwealth have adopted. So there were elements of the Natick policy that were um, a, pretty identical to the Amherst one. In the Superior Court, when they were ruling um, with, relative to Natick, um, essentially laid out the priority of um, free speech rights in um, what they called limited public forums. So in a limited public forum, which apparently what we're, this is what we're in, this is a limited public forum, um, you can regulate the, um, the period for speech or comments. So things like having a three minute limit on public comments um, is uh, apparently completely legal. Um, having a set time period for comments, like a 20 minute time, time period for public comments is also perfectly legal. Um, there were substantially greater questions around, around any regulation of the content of the comments. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, despite a, a 12 page decision that cited a number of, of court precedents that uh, argued really entirely in favor of, of not regulating the content of speech. Um, the uh, the uh, injunction ended by actually uh, allowing Natick to continue to impose its rule of not mentioning uh, names or titles in public comment, but that um, otherwise critiques were allowable. Um, I'm gonna be candid, I'm not an attorney, so maybe that's why the mysteries abounded for me. But um, I actually couldn't understand, based on my reading of the decision, um, why the court decided to continue to allow an imposition of the rule disallowing um, you know, identification of names or titles. Because even though um, they, they commented, I, I'm paraphrasing, but the comment was essentially that um, it could be sensitive and clearly sensitive. If you read through the decision, and it actually is available online, every other element of the decision uh, reinforced the priority of, of free speech rights. Um, and, they, and in fact, free speech rights, particularly in uh, governmental settings, so that when you have uh, a governmental body that's making decisions, they particularly have, um, there's a priority on allowing speech to occur and to not curtail that speech, except for, as I mentioned earlier, by appropriate um, regulation in limited public forums like the time limit on, on the comments or um, the uh, length of the total comment period. So um, with that, uh, I'm just uh, uh, sharing with the committee that as I am not want to violate the First Amendment and anything that I'm doing, um, my uh, proposal in terms of how to proceed just for the purposes of this meeting, and there's an item on later, the discussion for talking later, is that I think we should follow our current policy of having um, three-minute public comments in, an, in a specific uh, period of time for public comment, um, but that I am not inclined to enforce the other elements of our policy uh, around uh, the content of people's speech. And I'm happy before I proceed to hear from the committee on that, but um, uh, as I said, I am not going to inadvertently or intentionally violate the First Amendment rights of people who want to come up. Uh, rec recognizing that it's subject to litigation is not fully resolved. So the point is, the issue is not whether this decision is resolved in this case. The question is whether or not we, knowing 
uh, at least some of the limited facts of the Natick situation, are going to act in such a way that might risk or jeopardize the possibility that we are, in fact, infringing upon someone's First Amendment rights. So do I have that indulgence or not? I'm happy to take comments if there are any. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with that general approach. Um, I think it's the conservative approach. Um, like you mentioned in the opinion uh, from the decision you mentioned and in the opinion of our attorney, um, they both explicitly still allow for the prohibition of naming by reference to name or position. Mm -hmm. um, so going, again, going according to the most um, recent legal opinion, we would still be okay doing that. The conservative approach would be to allow that. So I'm, I'm fine with that conservative interpretation. Yes, I just have um, one, sorry, we're down the mic. Um, one comment, which would be um, in the effort of protecting the children that go to this school, that we would still want to refrain from naming students um, in any sort of complaint or uh, just to keep their privacy. And that's important. Okay. Is there anything else? Okay, then so uh, as, we, as we proceed and if we need again to extend the time period of the comment period, we will in, this, in the sense that, sorry, let me rephrase that. We're starting later than we originally intended. So on the agenda it says this is scheduled for 7.15 to 7.35. We can still find a way to do this for, I guess, 20 minutes uh, and uh, see where we are at that point. And we have a timer. Is the timer able to be shown to the public? Yep. But otherwise we're going to maintain the three minute rule on uh, on public comments. And if you have additional comments beyond three minutes, just submit them in writing to the committee, please. And they'll become part of the record of the meeting. I should say if you submit them in writing, they will become part of the record and minutes for the meeting. So they will in fact be maintained. Uh, and I guess, are you going to be my clicker or something there? I, I think I'm in the right seat for that. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Uh, so as I said, so three minute limit uh, and I'm just, I'm just stating it out loud again. People have heard what I just said earlier. Um, we're not, we're not, uh, it's just it's public comment period. So if anyone else to come up, please come forward, identify yourself. Oh, so the other rules still apply. Please identify yourself. Yes. Three minutes. Thanks. Hi, Tiffany Thibodeau, proud math teacher at Amherst Regional Middle School and Amherst resident. I'm going to read um, just a statement and I'll try to stay under three minutes. Um, on May 8th, ARMS staff spoke to you about our concerns for our school. 52 members of the staff signed a letter in support of the positive development of our school under Dr. Bodie's leadership. Educators do not sign public letters lightly, so those numbers have great significance. On May 22nd, ARMS staff hoped to share further suggestions and concerns, however, the, the negative remarks and atmosphere of public comment prevented the staff from being able to share the ideas. We are writing to you because we feel it would not be responsible as professional educators to be silent. Our essential message remains unchanged. Our ideas represent compromise. We are concerned that the negative focus that is plaguing our district, and particularly the middle school, is not allowing for the opportunity for the district or the school committee to work with us to consider possible solutions. Our primary concern is to sustain the positive direction of our school, and we have suggested actions that will lead to that. We acknowledge that the district has decided to move forward with hiring a two-year interim principal. This is not what we hoped for, but we acknowledge that this is the case. We appreciate that the district has tried to take some steps to respond to our concern, and we want to inform you that there are still some aspects for which we seek partnership. Partnership is the culture at arms. Since its early days in transforming from a junior high school to a middle school, we have been a school of teacher leaders. We have a history of collaborative and shared decision making in our inquiry groups, curriculum leaders, pr principal advisory committee, and our team structures. Together, we work to identify and solve problems to improve our school. Therefore, we share our solutions with you. In addition to inviting four members of the staff to meet with the selected interim principal this summer, we ask that leadership structure include Patty Bodie and Alicia Lopez in some capacity. We have non-administrative roles in mind in order to address the concerns about licensure. Patty Bodie and Alicia Lopez could be reappointed for non-administrative positions in our schools. We have precedence for these positions. For many years, we've had one and sometimes two teachers serve as dean positions. These positions could be dean of students, dean of faculty, or simply dean. We have also had 
um, things similar to coaches, instructional coaches, and curriculum coaches. All of these were non-administrative positions that were intended to support the staff in the school. These ideas and more could be explored with the middle school staff to create confidence during the transitional time. We see these individuals, Patty Bodie and Alicia Lopez, as central to continuing development of the work over the past two years, including making social justice a focal point in our school's mission. Reappointing them to these positions would allow for the con continuity of the social justice mission. I see that I'm also running out of time, but I do want to submit this letter with the rest of the writing um, to the committee. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. This is like an excellent role for the vice chair. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to keep it rolling. Uh, next, please. Hello. Good evening. My name is Irene LaRoche. I teach social studies at Amherst Regional Middle School. I'm here tonight for the third school committee meeting in a row to continue to share good news with you. I believe that actions speak louder than words. And I believe we need to be self-reflective as well as reach out to others as we reflect upon our work. I believe there are times when critique is necessary, but I also believe that collaborative solutions create more enduring and positive outcomes. I have been saddened by the discourse and mistruths taking place about our school district and our school. I've struggled to see the value in tearing down rather than building up our community. Each time I've spoken to you, I try to share good news of what's happening. Each time it's a snapshot, a simple piece of evidence from our daily work. Currently, seventh grade students are preparing for World Forum. World Forum is like a model UN, but unlike the UN, which would be made up of only privileged in a society, our forum asks students to consider all different people who make up the fabric of a country. Goal of forum is to consider worldview of people from countries across the globe as they discuss a contemporary issue. This year's students are looking at women's rights, climate change, indigenous people's rights, hunger and poverty, and access to clean water. In World Forum, students represent realistic point of view of a person from another country and simultaneously seek to see other viewpoints. Students create proposals for action, discuss proposals, and vote to see if they can come to agreements and compromises that meet the needs of all the countries represented. Teachers have been ending the year of, in seventh grade with World Forum since before I arrived in 2003. But now more than ever, the skills of civil discourse, working to understand multiple perspectives, and collective problem solving feel critical to our community and our society. We have much to learn from the passion and hope that our young people bring to the work. I hope that our community can move forward with a more generous spirit and collaborative mindset with problem solving and improvement as the goals. As critiques about racism and licensure have conflated, an important fact was ignored in the wave of critique about licensure swept up at least three administrators of color who will no longer be serving our community, including one at the middle school. I would like you to know that the staff have been talking about it and have concerns about the loss of these individuals and the important role they play for our diverse community. One solution that could be considered is the creation of professional development opportunities for people who do not currently hold administrative licenses. The organization of these opportunities should be inclusive of those administrators of color who are losing their positions, as well as other faculty who have an interest in developing skills and expertise for administrative licensure. I am sure there are many other ideas we can come up with together for the goal to sustain and build up our community rather than tear it down. I look forward to speaking with you again in the future to share the good of our students and our school. Thank you. Hello. My name is Cynthia Stankowitz, and I'm a veteran teacher at Amherst Regional Middle School. And after working for the past 33 years in Amherst, I have seen almost constant upheaval at the middle school in Amherst. During this time, the middle school has been a revolving door with administrators coming and going with such a high frequency that I can no longer remember all of their names. I have worked for the good, the bad, the mediocre. What I have learned over time is that such inconsistency is not good for anyone. With all the complications and controversies surrounding our current administration, I cannot help but feel incredibly sad that some very important points seem to have been overlooked or at the very least disregarded. We need consistency and stability. We need an administration that knows us and understands who we are. 
Two years ago, Patty Bodie, Dave Rainin, and Alicia Lopez were chosen to lead our school precisely because they understood the community. They were highly qualified educators with years of experience to back them up. Most importantly, they knew us. They trusted us and they were willing to listen to us. Their goal was to restore confidence in our leadership team and to heal our de demoralized school. In two short years, they did just that. They led by compassion, confidence, and example. They provided a humane and sane leadership with a consistent, progressive vision and created a healthy atmosphere for students and staff alike. In short, they brought stability to our chaotic and troubled school. To let these people go, who have provided consistency and continuity to our community is a shame and a real loss for us all. Unfortunately, we are now back to a rudderous, rudderless place with question marks about our future. I hope that people who felt compelled to criticize us harshly are feeling perhaps a little more happy now. They may be satisfied for the moment, but I suspect that perhaps they will not stay that way. Hopefully, one day our, day our community will see how important it is to stop fighting itself. We need to recognize the dangers that surround us. We need to wake up and stop looking at the trees instead of the forest. Um, I'm uh, Steve Zacon Anderson, math teacher at the middle school. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I do want to recognize and appreciate people here at this meeting, and I know Patty is not here tonight, um, who I think have been incredibly patient and absorbing a lot of uh, criticism here and have been very professional in their approach to that. Um, and I would, I, I'm basically going to be piggybacking on a lot of what was said and encourage and hope that the tenor of the meeting stays positive. Um, our children are watching, so I hope that we are going to behave accordingly. Um, I think I'll, I'll kind of share, I'm not speaking for the group as much as my own personal experience, but having come here two meetings ago with this um, letter signed by 80% of the staff, and as was pointed out, in Amherst, signing a, a letter is a risk unto itself. Um, and I hope people understand that that many people signing a letter was not for a crony, for a friend, or just to look out for our own. It's because we care so much about the school and we're so desperate for something that we finally had, which is the word you keep hearing tonight, I think, stability and consistency. And we saw that and we want, wanted to continue that. So um, I, I hope that people would hear what a significant statement that was from people that really care about our school and our kids, which, by the way, are your kids. Um, and over the uh, course of a couple of meetings, and actually over the course of the years I've taught here, as we go through this, these transitions, we get lots of compliments. The teachers get told, you're resilient, you rise to the occasion, more upheaval, but man, you just keep going. And um, I like the compliment, I agree with it, but we're looking for something more than compliments. We're looking to be heard, to be listened to, to be considered, um, to be part of the solution and to have what we say matter. So I would ask for us to, um, for hopefully, whether it's asking the school committee to listen or maybe, I know I can't question directly, but someone on the school committee may be asking the administration how they're addressing the concerns we have in our goal of um, the stability we desperately seek. Thank you.
Hello, Andrea Battle, community person, retired teacher, and very sympathetic person to the plight. However, there's a thing called licensure and certification, and no matter how you fudge it, one way or the other, that is the beauty of the public school. Most people are licensed and most people are certified. And I would like to say to the young lady, thank you so much for looking out for the people of color, but they should have the same standard. That's what I, my ancestors and I, who is now 70, have fought for. I do not want to be kept in a position that I technically, if I were white, would be moved. So if you move someone out, you move them out because they don't have the qualifications. I just need to say that because they're yelling at me now from the other side saying, what the heck's going on? And I'm telling you, you need to hear what I'm saying. It's not about somebody of color as opposed to whatever. There are certain things you just have to have. And I'd like to see this district get to the point where there's never a question. Because that's the criteria. And I'm one of the people who worked on the committee for the process, et cetera, and put in a lot of time on that because it is important. And like, I'm re like I said, I'm really sorry that I liked people and I almost lost a job because of certification and I understood and they gave me the couple of months because I was about two credits away in a month and that's the only reason I got a chance. So that's what it's about. Private schools have wonderful students and some of them have students who get through and learn nothing and they can even become president of the United States. <laughs> <Enough said. laughs> I'm Chrissy Harmon, and I'm here to pick up where I left off at the last school committee with respect to discriminatory hiring practices. This word racism that's repeatedly come up in the past couple of months has made some people so uncomfortable that it's important to discuss what's actually happening here, which is called white fragility. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable to the point that it triggers this range of defensive moves. <clears throat> Outward displays of emotion, such as anger. She is attacking me. This woman's the problem. It's not true. <clears throat> Fear, such as argumentation, silence, leaving and walking out of the room. This certainly describes the actions and the behavior and the reactions to what I've been saying up here by everybody involved. <clears throat> the context of racism that I was speaking about is in terms of a power dynamic. The power dynamic played itself out in this hiring process. In order to have a self-professed -progr progressive town, it's very essential to adopt this inalienable truth. And that's that this institution that we're talking about, the school committee, the public school, it was built by white people. And to this day, we all continue to benefit from that institution. And that's just a fact. Until that system is completely ripped down and built up, that's just always going to be true. No one needs to be offended. It's just a reality. <clears throat> now that that's out of the way, I would like to take a minute to say that $1,661,489 has been invested in paying unlicensed administrators in the last two years and being out of compliance with the Department of Secondary Education. I would also like to note that the middle school principal search and subsequent temper tantrums that have occurred by people that are not parents of students <clears throat> who were no longer benefiting from this eighty dollars to $90,000 a year that they were getting as a paid apprenticeship path to licensure, which is unheard of, <clears throat> Distracted from the reality and the fact that there were actually like five other vice principal positions that were supposed to be posted at the exact same time as the middle school principal hiring search. All those people were on hardship waivers. The day they were reassigned around May 10th, those positions should have been posted. It would have been very easy to avoid this mess if the system that long-term educators know inside and out was followed from the beginning. I'm just wanting to make sure in the last three seconds that the school committee is answering to the fact that $1.6 million has been invested 
in an unauthorized paid apprenticeship path to licensure? And where are the postings for the vice principal jobs? <coughs> Hi, I'm Norm, <clears throat> I'm Norm Price. I'm a teacher at the middle school. And um, thank you. I just wanted to um, offer support for the idea that we're part of what was happening here as well is that uh, people involved with hiring were, were looking for the, um, the most talented um, individual. And I think um, licensure is very important, but it's also important to have a wide range of experience to do this job, having job as a, as a school, as a teacher, as a principal, as, you know, all those things uh, develop over time. And I just want to thank people who are in the hiring position to be looking for people that have this level of experience because it's through that level of experience that we actually get people that know the full range of what's being asked of them in the job. And I, licensure is an important piece, obviously, but also that experience. And I think one of the things that's happening is we're looking for highly talented people who are experienced in this wide range of, 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 of skills. Um, there, are other, there are some frameworks that we also need to realize, which is that <clears throat> one of the reasons we absolutely need the best team on the ground is that we're not just an isolated district anymore. We're facing competition from surrounding districts. So this, this internal critique that we're going through is important, but we also have to realize that we're, we're not the only game in town, and we have to have the best team on the ground to compete with the other school districts that are around us. And I'm hoping that people that are applying critical lenses to our school district are doing the same thing to the other school districts. That is, they're doing the same sort of critical analysis so that we're, you know, equal, we're operating under equal scrutiny in that way because I think it's very important that, you know, everybody is examined in this way. It's not just about us. It's we're now in this field where we have other people in the marketplace. So that was my point of view. Thanks. Catherine Oppie, former school committee member and Amherst uh, citizen. Uh, the superintendent has received some criticism recently because the district or the administration re recently because the district is not 100% compliant with the state's licensure requirements. That's true. But the complaints have failed to consider a key contextual fact. Amherst and the regional district are 98.6% in compliance, a higher percentage than the state average of 97. Two. I'm also heartened to read in public documents that the district is committed to becoming 100% compliant by, the, by next year. This is not defensive or an attack, it's just fact that the district is also working hard to promote equity for students and staff. The vital work, this vital work, has to be a sustained effort to address all the ways that institutional racism and bias affect our students and staff every day. I think our school district is on the right track. The past, this past year, for example, the number of staff members of color who were hired reached a five-year high. The retention rate for staff of color is also at a five-year high. At the high school, a new restorative practice program was implemented with a new restorative justice staff position and has included multiple staff trainings, student engagement, and mentor support. A racial equity professional learning community was formed this year to increase understanding of racial inequities, including goals of recognizing cultural and institutional racism and understanding how white organizational culture affects our classroom practice and school policies. The high school did a climate survey this year which showed significant improvement from the same survey in 2015 to questions like, do teachers treat me with respect and is school a place where I feel safe? The high school community is continuing to look into this data to understand what has made the difference. An all day curriculum day for staff in March had workshops with topics that included how to have a difficult conversation about race and other identities, how to create restorative circles in classrooms, the impact of, of poverty um, and class on learning, mental health issues in the classroom with a focus on trauma, how to overcome <coughs> racial disparities in discipline reports. Many of these programs were directly recommended by the school committee's own equity task force 
and implemented by the administration. These initiatives are not widely known outside the school community, and there are several others that I haven't mentioned. Of course, our schools have a long way to go, but our administration and teachers are working in good faith in the interest of all students and staff. Thank you. My name is Sarah Marshall, and I have one child in the Amherst system, just finishing eighth grade. Two years ago, my family was very anxious about sending our daughter to arms, given all we had heard about the general instability in administration and low morale among the faculty. And we strongly considered sending her to private school. I want to thank Dr. Morris and Dr. Bodie for turning that sorry situation around so promptly and for fostering a very positive culture of respect for all and of academic excellence. Right now, ARMS is flourishing, at least in my eyes. I am all the more astounded at the recent accusations of racism leveled at Dr. Morris. As far as I know, there is nothing in the public record, either with respect to the search for a successor to Dr. Bodie, or in his words or actions over the last few years in the role of superintendent that remotely justifies such an inflammatory label. None of us, <clears throat> none of us are mind readers, and only Dr. Morris knows why he rejected applicants put forward by the principal search committee. Speculations about motives are just that, speculations. It distresses me to know that some members of our community apparently find it easy to believe the worst of Dr. Morris. It distresses me to find that the atmosphere surrounding the superintendent and the school committee is again becoming poisoned by suspicion and anger. I urge the committee to ignore complaints for which there is no evidence, even as it supports the superintendent's efforts to improve hiring practices. Thank you. I'm not cutting it off at you. <laughs> My name's John McCabe. I'm a Crocker parent, a second grade uh, student there. And thanks to the committee for all the great work you do. As someone who served as an ed education administrator for two decades, I saw again and again how important it is to follow HR rules and regs. I see this whole struggle as what I teach philosophy, what Hegel called the struggle to the death when both sides are right. And I think that's where we're at. Search committee procedures are there to ensure that hiring processes promote both excellence and fair opportunity. We all know that. At the same time, there's always a tension, and we know this too, between the need to, to attract strong and diverse outside candidates and the need to provide avenues of fair opportunity for folks already doing excellent work inside the system. I saw this where I worked. Um, having work, I'm going to use names. Having worked with both Mike Morris and Doreen Cunningham last year, uh, I got the sense that they are well aware of these issues and that Doreen was perhaps hired in part to, to make a real impact on this and focus on getting Amherst's HR house in order. Um, I'd like to congratulate Doreen or Assistant Superintendent Cunningham on the progress she's made so far on this and I'd like to lend my support to the idea that hiring and promotion uh, processes should follow proper HR procedures and adhere to state regs regarding certification requirements, okay? That said, I would like to finish by taking strong issue with those who have stooped to ad hominem attacks against our superintendent in recent weeks. Folks, we have real white supremacists at large and out of the closet all through the political system at the, at the national level. We all know about this. Um, we're at a crisis point, in my humble estimation, uh, where white supremacists are now emboldened to threaten the rest of us on a daily basis. Um, to smear folks here in the room uh, with that racist label for political effect, I think is really not acceptable. It's, it's a degradation of our local discourse and also uh, undermines and degrades the forceful critique and resistance so necessary in this time when so many real white supremacists um, need to be called out and forced back, quite frankly. Mike is not a racist. Let's hold our fire for uh, on that score for people who have, have it coming, okay? Thank you very much.
Hi, my name is Deb Leonard. I'm a parent of three children in the school system. I'm a Fort River Elementary School parent. I'm an Amherst Middle School parent, and I'm a high school parent. Um, I have two points. Um, they're short. The first is I take exception to the public criticism of Mike Morris's professionalism in a context in which he is unable to defend himself because of his professionalism. The second, Mike Morris's leadership as both interim and permanent superintendent has advanced our school district in its mission, and I quote, of uh, it, the academic achievement of every student learning in a system dedicated to social justice and multiculturalism. Thank you. Thank you. So, one more, but we're gonna, we need to hear to our time left. Vera Duongmany Cage, um, parent in Amherst. I um, want to throw out a figure, $575. That's what's being requested of me when I submitted my public records request around licensure in the district. Um, that is something that I believe um, is excessive considering that licensure is already um, work being done, um, as we have heard, and I don't think it should take that long to compile. So I'd be happy to forward the school committee my public records request and the response from the district. So you may consider waiving the $575 for information that is in the public domain um, that we should be promoting transparency that um, this should be information that's not hidden, um, but it should be out in the open regarding licensure in our district. Thank you. So that, yeah. Oh. It's not about the middle school. <laughs> 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 Although this has been thrilling to watch. Um, I'm Abigail Morris. I, I guess I'm not. I was a senior at the school <laughs> back in the day. Um, you can applaud for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, and I, I want this to come across as a very positive thing because as going to high school and also the middle school for um, a year and a half, I learned a lot about being an, act, like an advocate and an activist in a way, in a place that I was really supported in my views or most people agreed with me. Um, and I think the high school in particular did a really good job of having conversations that were really hard, like these. Um, Mr. Jackson calls them like white knuckle conversations, where you like, want to make a fist and grab the table until your knuckles turn white about everything from race to sexuality and gender to immigration to ability to refugees. Like across the table in school, we've had those discussions. And that's an amazing first step, um, but it's also a first step. And I think where the high school really fails is taking it beyond that step and um, showing students what they can actually do to have an impact. And a great example of that is the bill that the um, Mass Legislature passed recently about um, gun safety and taking guns away from people who are clearly should not have guns. And that was something that was mostly led by teenagers. And it happened because we called our legislators. We called our state rep and we called our state senators. And we told them, this is important. We want this to happen. And I don't think high schoolers understand how impactful their voices can be when it comes to influencing their elected officials, even if they can't vote. And now I'm speaking about all of you, because most of you, with the exception of the two of you, are elected officials. And I think that it, I imagine it must be hard to kind of represent people who can't vote for you, if that makes sense. Like, you're kind of, your job is to represent students and high schoolers and middle schoolers who, and elementary schoolers sometimes who are not 18 and can't vote. Um, and I have a whole bunch of issues with that. That's for another day. So kind of my proposal, and I think this should be easy, would be to send out an email, like maybe once a month, once every six weeks, and be like, here are the minutes from our last three meetings, and here is our next meeting and the agenda for that, just so students know what's happening. Because aside from like me and Jack and like the three friends, we can get to like listen to us rant about this. We don't know what's happening in these meetings. Um, but I think if you kind of made that intentional effort and reach out. It's really easy to send a math email to all the high schoolers, and I'm assuming also the middle schoolers, um, that they would be really interested in this. Like, I'm sure middle school students have a lot of opinions about this, and they don't necessarily know even who you are. Like, I don't think 99% of the high schoolers could name even one of you. 
right, until graduation, and maybe they can name you because you spoke. But, <laughs> like, they have no idea who you are. And if you email them, I think you'd be surprised at the number of students who want to be involved and just don't know how. That's it. So now. Okay. Um, we'll, yeah, I mean, we, we, we'll, before you speak, let me just say this. Before the next person speaks, we're going to close this after this comment. Okay. Good evening to all of you, and thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to speak. Um, the last time I was here, and I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, if you had addressed uh, what happened at the last school committee meeting when the, uh, the, the committee left in the middle of someone's uh, testimony. And um, I was locked out, so that was partly why I was late. Um, of this building, I mean. Um, I just want to say that conversations are difficult to have when they, um, they impact us as deeply as they do as currently uh, these conversations that we're having about licensure in the district uh, do. But, and, and I have asked that all of us try to hear uh, what each one of us has to say on these issues. And I don't think that's an unreasonable request, uh, regardless of what side you find yourself. Um, but I, I want to say, as a person of color, that I am a little frustrated when uh, white people try to tell me uh, how much is being done for people of color, for students of color, if people of color are coming to you and saying to you, that we are disproportionately affected by policies and practices in the district. Please hear us. Please believe us. We're not lying to you. I don't need anyone who has not had my experience to tell me what my experiences are. And I am speaking as a parent, and I am speaking as a person of color, a member, a tax-paying, law-abiding uh, member of this community, to please, this is the body to whom we go when we want to, to, when we have concerns, when we want to speak back to policies and practices, it is our right, you tell us so. And I'm asking you, please, the kind of disrespect that I saw happen here last time of one uh, member of the community being trolled by, by members of this school uh, committee, I found it shameful, sir. And I just wanted to register that. And if we are going to have conversations as difficult as they are, the least we can do is to be respectful. We can hear each other's perspectives and respect each other's perspectives. Thank you very much. Okay, so that closes the public comment section. Are there any announcements from the committee? If a number of members were actually at the graduation ceremony of the day, uh, but it was actually, as it always is, an inspiring exercise. Absolutely wonderful exercise. It focuses on what we're here for. Uh, next is licensure update. So uh, I'll start the update, and, and then I think um, Ms. Cunningham will finish it, and you know we'll be open to any questions that, that the committee has. So, unless you want me to be in three minutes, well, <laughs> which I'm fine with. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I want to start from a place of um, acknowledging that our district has had challenges as it relates to educator licensure. Uh, I also want to say that we've been and we continue to be dedicated to resolving these issues, that both things can be true. We can both acknowledge that issues have existed and also talk about our work that has uh, been an ongoing effort uh, of this whole year to resolve them. And I want to compliment Ms. Cunningham, who, when she first started in the summer, uh, recognized some of the issues and started to work on them head on. And I think a key phrase we want to talk about is working on, working on these issues with our faculty and with our staff members, that 
yes, we need to have licensed staff, and that's what we're dedicated to. And we also want to recognize and acknowledge that uh, we have wonderful staff members that we want to work with uh, to realize that goal. As in any other area that we have in our district, we're ded in dedicated and committed to implementing the best practices moving forward. And fortunately, we've been able to partner successfully with DESE on the licensure issue. Um, I'm trying to think how many times between you and I we've called the licensure office um, this year. That number's a pretty high number. And um, they answer the phone, they get back to us, and they give us clarity on information. Um, and they've been an active partner in supporting our work to improve our practices in this area. Uh, one, for instance, one area of guidance that DESE Legal has offered us recently is about the actions uh, decisions that administrators have made at times where they've been unlicensed. Uh, I'm not talking about people who are wavered, but uh, folks who have not had an active license at any point. And DESE's legal department has uh, shared with us that the decisions made by these administrators are valid as long as the process used in making those decisions uh, cons was consistent with state and federal guidelines. We wanted to make sure that if there was um, a need to go back to prior decisions that were made that we would um, do whatever DESE legal's DESE's legal department would tell us needed to happen. And that's the kind of support, separate from whether I'm happy or unhappy with their guidance, that's the kind of guidance they've been giving us consistently. That's a more recent one, but that's the guidance they've been giving us throughout this year. As we move forward, our commitment is that 100% of our administrators are fully licensed for the 2018-2019 school year. And I'd like to talk about the current roster of administrators uh, and their licensure status moving forward. Uh, and I think I'm going to go school by school because I want to be very specific um, and try to um, share with the committee and the community our plans moving forward that are still in, some of them are still in process, some of them are not, some of them are established. I'll start with the high school. So the high school principal, Mark Jackson, has his professional license. Um, the assistant principal, Mickey Gramacki, also has her professional license. I should say assistant principal, principal license. Talib Sadiq, who was hired to be the second assistant principal at the high school last month, or relatively recently, has an initial license in good standing. And the last person who's an administrator at the high school is Rich Ferro, who's the athletic director, and both Ms. Cunningham and then the DESE's educator licensure office confirmed that there is no license for a, an athletic director. Uh, much like an HR director, there is no license for. And there are other roles that work in school districts where there is no license. Um, the only thing that would be a limitation of Mr. Farrow's work, or any athletic director, depersonalizing it, is that um, they can only manage about, it's under 20% of their time has to be uh, spent evaluating licensed staff members. If it bridges that, then they need a different license. Mr. Farrow has a very light uh, evaluator load. It doesn't come close to 20% of his responsibilities. Um, so that's the administration at the high school. Mr. Farrow also does some work and support the middle school as well. Uh, he's primarily at the high school, but he also does support the athletic director there as middle school sports. At Summit Academy, uh, Dave Slovin is a principal, and he also has a professional license. The middle school, the principal search is underway. There's multiple highly qualified candidates uh, who have their licenses in the pool. Only a licensed candidate will be hired. Once someone is hired, once a candidate's hired, which will be in the next two weeks, a leadership structure will be determined to figure out the rest of the vacancies at the middle school level. And uh, much like the rest, what we've committed to the community, um, to ourselves, and to DESE is that we're only uh, able to hire licensed uh, folks who have the assistant principal principal license for those roles. At Fort River School, Diane Chamberlain is the principal, and she is under a valid ad, uh, initial license. At Crocker Farm, Derek Shea is the principal. He is working under a valid professional license. At Wildwood, Nick Yaffe is the principal, and he's also working under a valid professional license. And, and all the things I just mentioned are not contingent on other things happening. These are their current licenses as of today. So we are currently in the process at the elementary level of reviewing whether assistant <laughs> principal roles, uh, just for those, some backstory, uh, background, um, elementary assistant principal roles are 10-month positions that start in mid-August. So that's a little different than, for instance, Ms. Gramacki's role, uh, which is a full-year role, assistant principal at the high school. Uh, but at the elementary level, those are school year plus a certain amount of days. 227, yeah. So it, it's, it's, it, it does build in days above the teacher contract, but it's not, they don't work during the summer. And so we have a little time. And so we're in active discussions with our principals 
uh, about what that will look like, whether we're going to maintain having assistant principals next year or whether alternative leadership models, which are used in several neighboring districts, will be implemented. If we do hire for assistant principals uh, at those schools, only applicants with the appropriate licensure will be considered. In the past, we've utilized assistant principals in most of our elementary schools, right now all, but there were times where it wasn't in all. Um, and there's no state directive or mandate to do so. The advantages of having assistant principals at the elementary level is they can be more heavily involved in student discipline, particularly suspensions, than non-administrators. At the elementary level, we have very infrequent suspensions, but it still is helpful to have uh, another adult who can be involved in that if the need arises. They can evaluate teachers. Um, that's a, a role that's clearly defined to be an administrative role. And currently, they often share IEP meetings, so special education meetings and 504 meetings. Alternative, alternate models uh, used other places shift responsibilities. Uh, so for instance, chairing IEP meetings can often be done by education team leaders who are not administrators um, with background and expertise in special education. Uh, we've had that at different times in the past at the elementary level. It's currently the model at the middle school and high school where education team leaders are the primary uh, folks involved in chairing special education meetings. In terms of evaluation and discipline, uh, if we were to go to alternate models, more of this work would fall to principals, but other tasks, such as curriculum development and staff leadership, could be shared with um, non-administrative staff or staff in non-administrative roles. In terms of local districts or comparisons, the elementary schools in Longmeadow, Northampton, and Wilbraham, three districts with similarly sized elementary schools, some of those are a little smaller, Longmeadow in particular has some larger ones, they do not have assistant principals and they rely on other uh, mechanisms to make sure that student and staff needs are met. However, South Hadley and several of the elementary schools in West Springfield do have assistant principals. So it's a local decision that's made by local districts about how to structure their schools to make sure that, again, student needs and staff needs can be met. Both models, having assistant principals and, princ and not having assistant principals, can work. Uh, the big shift is that models, uh, with the different models, is who does which aspects of the work does significantly change. And that's why we're giving principals some time after the school year to sort through their needs uh, and define what model they'd like to have in their school building. And they'll be making the determinations uh, once things quiet down a little bit. And um, most of the staff and students are off for summer vacations. And if they do post vacancies, they'll engage the school communities in any vacancy that gets posted um, and having a team of um, staff members, uh, parents, guardians, community members to be involved in that selection process. So uh, just to summarize before I think Ms. Cunningham um, shares some of her, her, her work um, around licensure is that we currently have licensed principals in all of our schools. Uh, when we look at the teams we have at the, the high school, everybody's where they need to be with licensure. Middle school, we'll have that sorted pretty soon in terms of the principal and build from there uh, out about uh, what other vacancies need to have. And at the elementary level in Amherst, I want to be careful I'm not talking about Pelham here, just Amherst because it's not, sometimes we can link those. Um, there's a consideration of what staffing model is going to be best meet the needs of students and staff in the schools. Uh, and that'll be announced to the school communities and there'll be an engagement process around selection, whatever the role is, uh, whatever roles are posted. But when you, forgive me. Yeah, please. There's a last summing thought I'd yeah. like you to add to that if you're willing to. Please. Um, but whatever staffing model that is, it'll be appropriately licensed and the duties will conform with Absolutely. state regulations and policies and laws? That precisely. Um, okay. So again, our work with DESI has been um, a very collaborative one. Uh, I think they're aware and we're aware and we've been very transparent about uh, some of the challenges that the district has faced over the years and we and they are very committed to us making um, changes around that in short order and uh, that's what we've committed to and that's what we're going to do. Can I be slightly more blunt? Please. Um, you, you, I'm assuming your efforts to engage the principals in the uh, whatever kind of management model you're, you're organizing for the elementary schools, you're not, you're, you're, I assume you're trying, based on what you just said, you're trying to do this in a way in which you're allowing the principals to provide some sort of leadership in how they're <laughs> organizing their schools. And what you're not doing is you're not reverse engineering an outcome either based on personnel or based on some preconceived notion of, of how you, in other words, you're not, oh, you're not, 
the point I make, I'm, let me be really blunt. Yeah. There's an accusation I've heard yeah. that you were trying to jury rig how you're staffing out um, leadership within elementary schools to reverse engineer an outcome that somebody might have in mind. And I'm, what, I'm, what, I, what I would rather, I mean, if this is a true statement, um, I would like to hear from you whether you think there's any validity to that and what you're doing and clarify that you're actually going to, you know what I mean? You know what I'm getting at? I, I mean, do. I'm sorry. Be even more pointed and blunt if you want me to be. Perhaps I needed that <laughs> second round of bluntness. Um, no, I think that's spot on. And um, to be very blunt back, any position that gets posted, whether it's an assistant principal position, a staff leadership position, we'd be posted and have a fully open, transparent process with community members involved in the selection. Um, it's not going to be internal postings. They're not going to be uh, anything that um, has the appearance of nor uh, predicts the outcome of that search. It's really, can we create a model that's going to work for students and staff? And then how do we find the best person to fill that role? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little thick on the front end of that. So, do you want to ask questions now or do you want to go through your presentation? I apologize. I jumped in only because I felt like you were dangling in the point you were trying to make. Yeah, I appreciate taking care of that dangle. So I'll just say the second part of the presentation is only to um, explain a, another part of the DESI request. Sure. So I just need to... Oh, yeah. Is that far enough? I think so. I go down this way. Okay. So Desi had requested some information. Uh, Dr. Morris just mentioned part of the information that they requested in our response to Desi. And what I will say is that at the last school committee meeting, I said I would take partial responsibility for some of the things that occurred when we requested the waivers. And in taking that responsibility, I showed, I showed the current slide about the screenshot that the screen that I looked at when I um, requested the waiver and how when you look at the screen in school spring that it just showed one person and so I requested the waiver saying that one person had applied for the position. So Desi asked that we go back now and now that I know how to use school spring I've been going into the activity log which was what I mentioned before. So I just wanted to show another screen same thing. So here's the other, another screen for another position that was posted where I requested waivers and I was able to list all the licensed applicants for that position. So these are two things that we were, two additional pieces of information that was being sent to DESI to explain why one request or a few, I think about four or so requests mentioned one candidate and then other requests showed other candidates had applied for the position. So these are some of the, the shots, the screenshots that I'm sending there so that they can see what we saw. And then we have the letter from School Spring. The first one. Sorry. So this letter from School Spring basically just lets us know that. As mentioned, it was just a my error, right? So I called it a glitch, it's human error, just a, as they mentioned in the highlighted portion, a lack of knowledge about certain features that SchoolSpring has for me to be able to go back in and find all the candidates that applied. And so SchoolSpring wrote and let us know that, or let, for you guys to know and understand that we did not create these filters that is a default filter in the school spring program. It's just at the time, I did not know how to use that program. So in addition to the screen prints, I'm sending Desi this letter that we received from school spring. Yeah. And I think I just want to share with that, that that I own is my responsibility for a new staff member to have kind of more updated training and um, the training that Ms. Cunningham received did not resolve this challenge. Um, so I, I also want to be sensitive that um, so I was new in the role and the person who did the training um, wasn't successful at resolving this. And, and so uh, I don't want Ms. Cunningham to take as much ownership as perhaps she just did. That's Hello. why I said partial. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, yeah. Um, just a, a question, because I, I noticed in the letter that it says that um, 
ongoing training is a valuable tool for customers to ensure detailed understanding of the capabilities, features, and functions of the solution. So does this mean that they are offering training to the district and will we be taking that? So they have offered training, yes, and we will be scheduling some training from our H with our HR department so that we can then turn key it to our principals and administrators. Great, so um, are there questions or comments, Mr. Denver? Yeah, so thank you for this. Um, it's been a while since we last met, so it's good to get a lot of update. Uh, it's a lot to unpack there, so I'll just kind of summarize with some comments and then just one question. So I think in general, the approach you're taking of having 100% licensure for, for the next school year is the right goal to have and only hiring license applicants. I think that's the proper way to be responding to this situation that you both inherited. Um, and as, as we monitor that going forward, um, I, I really look to DESE as, as the regulatory authority and the body that can speak to uh, is this current situation acceptable, are we doing the right thing? Um, you know, therefore, I'm, I'm been glad you know, since last meeting to know that Doreen has been on this since August, has been working with DESE uh, since August. Um, I think it can get confusing when we have opinions from different um, vantage points about the nature of licensure and I'm sure most in our community were probably not down in the weeds and the details of licenses as many are now. Um, but I really look to DESE on this. So I look forward to the next letter that we get from DESE um, saying uh, whether what we're doing is okay. Um, I was happy to read in the news a few weeks ago that they said this is definitely not an investigation, that they've been working with us, and, and we go forward from there. Um, there was another point that came up in um, public comment that I was really happy to hear, uh, and that's that you know, when we try and get our heads around the nature and scope of this licensing issue, um, you know, to, that we need to put this in the context of, of how other schools are operating and, and that, you know, and someone brought up charter schools and this, this critical analysis of charter schools. I think most people would be pretty surprised to hear that administrators and teachers at charter schools aren't required to be licensed and that the license levels at the charter schools in our area are under 70%. So, you know, if you're really looking to dig into a critical analysis of licensure and how that affects education, I think charter schools are a good way to go, but I'll, I'll stop digressing on that point. Um, so, so, yeah, so I look forward to the next letter. Um, and I guess my, my question is, is, is another thing that came up during public comment, which is um, understanding and accepting that this is the way we're going forward and, and it having it had its impact on the middle school principal search. Um, we had 52 teachers sign a letter asking for uh, continued openness and flexibility and dialogue uh, as the middle school leadership structure evolves. And uh, we haven't heard a lot of detail on that um, because everything has been <laughs> up in the air, obviously. And so um, one is I hope to hear more updates mm -hmm. from you on that going forward. But I just wanted to get your, your take on that, what that uh, number of teachers signing onto that letter means to you and, and how that affects your thinking about it going forward. Um, so. We certainly read every letter we receive from whether it's staff member, community member, um, and we read them closely and, and consider them closely. Uh, what we've done, I think it was referenced uh, a little bit earlier in terms of moving forward is we have uh, put out a call to the middle school staff to create a leadership team that would work with Ms. Cunningham, myself, whoever gets hired. Um, I think we're roughly looking at four um, staff members, and I'm being explicit as saying staff members um, because there's a whole lot of staff members who identify as teacher, and then there's a whole lot that do not as well, and, and they're all valuable um, to the middle school experience. To work over the summer on the transition, um, that this transition, whoever we hire, I'm um, sure they'll be wonderful, and they're gonna need to make strong relationships with middle school staff on the get-go. Uh, I'm fortunate, we're fortunate that we received, you know, you never know, it's summertime, people uh, may be off doing other things, having other work, doing, uh, spending time with their family, and received uh, a good number of applications. It was applications, it was kind of long form, I mean, it was asking a paragraph about their thoughts about things, and that's, I think, going, in my opinion, it's going to be a critical group moving forward to help make decisions so that when we get back in the fall, the new principal is acclimated to the needs of the middle school, understands some of the tensions that perhaps exist at the moment, and has actively worked to build relationships and, and their understanding of this middle school, what the current needs are, and a direction that can move forward. So um, 
I'm not saying it's everything, but it was a very it was an idea that um, came up, and I thought it was a great one um, to really start moving forward with a leadership group over the summer that meets multiple times for long stretches. I mean, like two to th like half days, multiple times so that the new principal is positioned for success. It also gives the staff a window into decisions that get made over the summer that are integral for how the school year starts. Um, I think there's a balance or a tension, perhaps, um, depending on your point of view, I guess. Um, I think there's a lot of really good reasoned arguments to take actions before someone's hired, and um, I'll just say I've been um, resistant to that that um, my approach in generally has been to support principals and certainly give feedback where feedback is needed, but uh, to make sure they feel empowered to be leaders of their school. And so I am hesitant to make uh, decisions before someone's hired. Um, I think the implications of ha the entry plan for that person are greatly affected when um, someone in my role or Ms. Cunningham's role starts making, uh, is making multiple decisions um, that greatly impact how that person's going to experience their role. and and so. The thing I want to say is the counter argument to that is incredibly reasonable, right? If I was someone who, whose uh, school year ended next Thursday, uh, the uncertainty of this, some decisions not being made while I'm at work, uh, it's entirely legitimate and reasonable to have a sense of frustration around that. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, we've heard that, and I think we heard it in the letter tonight. And I want to honor that, that that's uh, a totally reasonable thing from an educator's point of view. And for me, um, I think I had to weigh the, I am having to weigh that uh, as compared to making sure that I'm positioning someone we're hiring for success, in my opinion, uh, giving she or he some leeway and some decision making and support along making decisions along with a leadership group. Uh, I think that's really important for the entry into the school environment. So I, I want to acknowledge that there's different points of view on this. I want to acknowledge the reasonable rationality of both sides and explain why I've been hesitant to move forward with decisions uh, before we hire someone uh, for that role. Um, Sosinski. Sosinski. Um, so I just want to say that I've spent a lot of time reading um, emails that the public has sent um, or, you know, Mr. Salisbury wrote a nice opinion piece in the uh, Amherst Bulletin. And I, I just want to say that despite that I can't, I'm not often in a position to respond, I, I do read them all. Um, and I think, you know, my couple of takeaways, as well as all the data the district has provided, um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that clearly, you know, Mr. Salisbury was my teacher 25 years ago. Um, I I appreciate his experience in the school, and I and I, you know, fullheartedly believe that that was his experience, and that that's where we were then. And I hope that in that 25 years we've come a long way. And I acknowledge we're not where we need to be. Um, and you know, I think we've made big improvements, and I think there's room to grow. Um, and so in that effort, I know you guys have sort of instituted some, you know, best practices and, and are continuing to improve. Um, and I think it's, you know, maybe my job as the school committee to make sure that we're measuring you against those goals and that we see that we're continuing to move in the right direction um, at a pace and speed that makes sense for us. Um, so along those lines, um, what I was looking for, um, you know, after the summer, I know there's always a lot of hiring that occurs in a, in a normal summer. This one may be even more, um, that at the beginning of the school year when it makes sense, when everybody's sort of in their positions and we've had time to get the school year rolling, um, would be an opportunity to look through all of the new hires and their licensure status that we checked that they came in, that we have their licenses, that they're valid and appropriate for the roles that they're in. Um, if there are waivers that are applied for, um, that the school committee understands that why the waivers were, were there um, and what they were for. Um, and then my the other half of that, because there's really two issues here, right? We have the licensure issue and then we have the ongoing you know, are trying to reach our diversity goals within the school staff. And so the other half of that is part of that you were, I was able to get data um, from your summative evaluation artifacts um, that showed some of the metrics that you've been keeping internally, but to, um, just to report on those um, sort of annually, um, which is 
um, you know, have we hired, you know, what's the percentage of hires, new hires that are um, minority staff? Um, and then it would, I think, you know, the ultimate goal here is that we have diversity at all levels of our organization. So when we look at um, our staff, you know, what's the, the sort of the percent minority staff or whatever groups that make sense to put that in. I'm not the expert there. At the different levels of the organization, so paraprofessionals, we have this pathways program because we know we have a larger diverse pool at paras than we do at teachers. And I imagine that's, you know, a similar funnel to administration is probably less. Um, so that if we tracked those, you know, over many years, we should be seeing improvement. And then we know we're, we're doing a good job or that our policies and our procedures and our best practices are supporting our goals. Um, so that would be something I'd be looking for in that coming time frame. And, and certainly, I'm, I'm not the expert in what the right groupings are and what the right licensure groups are, but um, I think that that allows us to have some accountability, not on your day-to-day -day decisions. I, I don't want to know what your day-to-day -day decisions are, um, but that overall, year over year, that we're going in the right direction. Do you have any, and there may not be any immediate response to that? I, don't know. I think um, if we can, so I'll just say um, to me that makes sense and I think perhaps we can talk uh, at a future meeting about the timings and logistic of that and even I think to have agreement of the committee and, and the two of us on what the groupings are um, because I, I think we could do that work ourselves and that might be inconsistent with what committee members might be wondering about. So. Um, to me, that actually would be a great future agenda item um, to dig into, not on in terms of the data, but actually about what data we want to do, we want to pull, and how to, what's a, a reasonable timeline for an annual report, and, and Ms. Cunningham could share also about the hiring cycle and when she would be able to report back out on some of those variables. Um, is that a no, I just, the only thing I want to say is that I would like to remind the school committee that during the November 28th meeting, I did mention about the licensing and, re and retention of teachers mm -hmm. and such. Mm -hmm. So the time frame would be about the same, like late fall, where we would be able to report on the same thing. Okay, so I have right now Ms. Ordonez, then Ms. Spitzer. And please raise your hand if you want to talk. There we go. <laughs> So I just have a couple of questions, um, partly I think uh, coming from myself and then also partly coming from just questions that have arisen from the community um, that I think just are important to help us understand, you know, some of the changes that you've been talking about that are going to be implemented moving forward, right? Um, so one of the questions that I have is, um, is there a protocol in place uh, to keep track of when licenses expire, right? Um, and so what I mean by that is, you know, do managers keep track during annual reviews or is there some other mechanism that kicks into place um, to help, you know, uh, administrators keep track of, of those license expirations? Um, and then the other, the other question, I'll just say them both now so that you guys can decide how you want to answer these. Um, you know, what I've gathered from conversations that I've had both with the superintendent and with the assistant superintendent is that uh, DESE does not notify district of applications, right? So that means that if a, uh, you know, a, a, an educator or administrator's license is about to expire and they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is applying for a license renewal, uh, that DESE doesn't let you know about that, right? And so, um, I'm wondering if, if educators and administrators are required to notify the district. So, you know, are your own staff required to let you know when they apply for license renewals? So to answer the first part, when I came in July, I wasn't told of any protocols or any procedures or process for what you're asking uh, to occur. I spoke recently to the director of, or the assistant director of information systems to find a way to get this information included in the My Learning Plan so that when an educator is completing their annual goal, they're also reporting on their licensing status. Um, the other part about um, DESI, DESI um, sent me this letter today and I just took some excerpts from it because as mentioned previously, the license is the individual's responsibility. So they copied it, or they sent me this email to say that um, 
when an educator gets their license, the quote is listed in the email or sent to them, letting them know that it's their responsibility to remain informed and current. They also want us to know as a district that we are also responsible for making sure that we have licensed individuals, right? So, Bless you. moving forward, <laughs> we will continue to work with DESE to, um, to just make sure that we're, we're following every process, every procedure, every licensing update, and um, ask, we will ask and work with our staff to inform us of whatever um, applications they've sent in via that My Learning Plan um, new page or new question that they have to respond to. Mm -hmm. Ms. Fitzgerald? So um, my question was very similar, I'm wondering how we could institutionalize a process of finding out when administrators are at risk of being unlicensed, because I think we're doing a good job of you communicated clearly how we're making sure that people were hiring our license, but it seems like a lot of the issues we've had have actually been folks who were licensed at one point in time, and yet um, we're not licensed. Um, we're not keeping their act licenses active. So it sounds like you just responded to that question. And I think I would also just like to echo that I have also been listening to and reading all of the emails from everybody, and it's been really frustrating not to be able to have as much of a two-way dialogue as I'd like to have um, in this role um, due to um, open meeting law concerns and also just um, you know, the, the, being in this public role has been frustrating sometimes because we can't go back and forth as much as we like. But I'd like to say that I'm listening to everybody and reading all of your emails. So thank you. And that was it. Could I, could I, could you jump in after? Yeah. Is it gone? Thanks. Um, so the beauty of going last is that everybody else has already asked my questions. <laughs> um, so I, I had uh, the same questions that Ms. Ordonez did, and, um, and similar to Ms. Spitzer and Ms. Um, um, <laughs> Kaczynski, sorry. Um, I also have been reading everything. I've been also doing my own research and, and asking questions of you both. And um, so one, I want to thank you for updating us in this really thorough and detailed update not just tonight, but also at every step along the way, and answering my questions um, and, and everybody's questions throughout the process. Your candor and detailed, thorough responses have been really appreciated. Um, and while this, um, the last couple of month, months have been maybe uncomfortable going through this process, I, I am appreciative that this was brought up and, and sort of um, elevated for a focus and, and, and conversation, because I think um, it is important, and uh, you know, knowing you were on it already since August, um, both of you, and and I think now the community is aware of the hard work that you've been doing, um, and and the and the work that that you're putting in place going forward. And I think this whole process has um, brought that to everybody's attention, started the conversation, and also um, pointed in ways and directions that we can continue to improve and strengthen that process overall. So thank you. So I don't have questions because you already asked them. <laughs> Can you just come on up to the microphone then, please? Um, so I was just hoping that uh, I could be uh, a tad selfish and greedy for a second and go back to uh, Mike's comment or Mr. Dr. Morris's comment earlier about the possibility of taking uh, a little bit of a look at how we would go forward with the, the role of slashing a, an assistant principal or something else. So I think the, the thing that I try and listen to when I'm in the back and come to the meetings in, in the weeks we, we don't have enough time to do this recently because we're, we're obviously got some challenging conversations taking place. But what's the purpose of coming to school, right? What, what, is, the, what is the role of coming to school, right? And so I've said this at these meetings before. It, for me, it's all about social mobility, right? It's so that someone like myself, working class person, can actually maybe have some good teachers, some people in my life, some family members, a little bit of luck along the way, and then you get to do something different with your life, right? And you can get out of the situation you're in, a little bit of choice, right? So for me, that's what school's all about. So how does that connect to what we're talking about with the assistant principal piece, right? So I'm definitely in with Mike in terms of this perhaps sort of contemplation or, 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 or to take a look at, you know, how we could actually set something up. But what I'm not interested in is some sort of abolition of a role because it takes a very large number of people, and this is where the greed and the selfishness comes in, right, to actually do the work that we're trying to do so that we can 
sort of promote this idea that, that, that kids can come to school and have that possibility of moving beyond what your, 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 your situation is, right? So, I, I, you know, and one thing I do like about working with Mike, he's, he's fine where someone like me fires in a comment that's maybe not exactly going, and this maybe keeps me around sometimes, right? Because I'm willing to just jump in and say, not, not the party line all the time. So I, I don't think I heard this up here, but I, I think I heard about Long Meadow and other places. We can't abolish like the, the leadership role like an assistant principal does, right? Whether we modify it and change it and do something different, I'm all up for, a, for a thinking about that. But it takes important leaders other than myself to make sure that our schools are trying to do what we are having them try to do, right? And, and so I just want to make sure that we, and I, I don't think I heard that up here, but I was just a little bit nervous in the back. It's not like a should we or shouldn't we have that person. We need that person, right? It's, it's imperative. And I'm happy to sit down with any of you at any point and explain why. Um, the modified role or a different role, sure, but there, there has to be additional leadership people in the school if we want to do the job that we're trying to do. Right, thank you. So um, I have a couple couple comments and I might think of a question. On, on that note there, I was just sort of elaborating because I was sort of picking on you earlier, uh, Mike, on this question of how you were going to identify or how the team was going to identify um, any additional roles beyond the principal in terms of leadership. And what I was picking on, and, and I, I, I'm probably at a couple points in this conversation going to speak very bluntly. Because I, I always say that every meeting, and usually I'm blunt, but I, sometimes I'm not, because um, I, 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 uh, I'm naturally kind of polite. But, um, but the reason I'm saying I'm being blunt is just because um, the public has seen or received some level of the criticisms that are being um, put at the feet of the superintendent, the assistant superintendent and the school committee and then others leaders in the district. But um, the reality is there's a whole host of things that have been um, um, put out as accusations around what the motivations are of the district. And it's an interesting challenge because um, when you sort of sort out the different facts and things uh, in different statements, that you have, you have a combination of some things um, that may be true. So you have some lapped licenses, you have other people who were on waived licenses and um, things like that. And so as, as we look at this, uh, this so-called DESI letter that was reported and received by the district, you know, DESI identified a number of things that they viewed as being um, practices that clearly needed to be improved and outcomes that needed to be changed in terms of how we were managing that process, right? Um, the challenge is what we also have largely in the discussion, either that's occurring publicly or um, that is being received um, voluminously by the school district, is also a lot of other things that may in fact have no basis in fact whatsoever. And so one of the ones I was picking on was the idea that if the district is thinking about how it should best organize its elementary schools and what's the best way to meet the needs of children and support staff in those schools, that somehow that was going to be rear, sort of reverse engineered or gamed because there was some effort to get around um, licensure rules or laws. And the message, and so I was asking that question, and you could have answered it any way you wanted. Mm -hmm. If you'd wanted to say, that's exactly what we're doing, Eric. How clever are you to figure that out? Um, you could have said that. Um, but what I was really trying to do was, was have m as much clarity and blunt talk as we can around some of these decisions and approaches, um, knowing also, by the way, that I think our, our district is in a challenging moment right now because um, overall, as best I can ascertain from what I've heard, and, and similarly, I read all the letters we get and um, all the outreach we get, um, we're at a point in which there's a real crisis in terms of morale in the district, and there are a lot of people who are deeply concerned. They're deeply concerned about whether they're valued. They're deeply concerned about whether um, they're going to um, be in a position in which every decision they make and every action they take is going to be um, uh, publicly discussed and publicly debated in a way that most people would never put up with with their jobs. Now, there's a public dimension to this work that naturally requires it to be um, more public than it would otherwise, but the reality is our district is made up of human beings. The complex organizations are made up of human beings. The entire point of the enterprise of this organization is try to enable childhood development and support children um, who, and families who are trying to nurture a pathway for their kids, right? And so in that kind of environment, I'm just sort of calling out the fact that um, we have to be both 
have fidelity to the law, fidelity to what would be considered best prudential practice, um, but we also have to have fidelity to each other and to the community that we love and that we're dedicated to. And, and in fact, I would argue that while we are having fidelity to the law and fidelity to the best practice and being developmental in that way, I would actually argue that if you, if you lose the spark in the thread of understanding, I think echoing something Principal Shea said it a moment ago, the core mission you have and the fact that this is an entity made up of human beings who all have to be able to center themselves, come to work, and provide an environment for each other, for the students and for the public in general, um, knowing that it's public and knowing that it's challenging, that we have to take care with that. We have to take tremendous care with that. And I'm saying that out loud now just simply because um, I don't want to walk down a path. I know we're talking about licensure right now. I'm going to focus in on that. I, I, am, I am amazingly uninterested in having this school committee in this district and this public conversation go down a profoundly destructive path. And so the question is, what are the alternatives that lead us out of that destructive path but also adhere to core principles or core ideas or values that we have as a society writ large, legally, uh, also within the community that we're working in, the community that we're serving. And so, and so to me, um, a couple things. I mean, one, I was calling out this question of how you're structuring it because I really wanted to be incredibly blunt yeah. that, if you, that if you're making decisions around uh, the structure and leadership and the role of individuals within the elementary school, that you've already thought through the fact that this is in fact an intentional act around um, what's gonna serve the best structure for the staff and for the kids, and that within that course, it goes without saying, it doesn't go without saying in the context of this conversation, yeah. but it goes without saying, which is why I was calling it out, that you're gonna have fidelity to whatever the appropriate licensure rules, as yeah. well as other professional development, other experiences, that individuals bring to a job that make them outstanding leaders, outstanding contributors to the communities. That's why I was calling that out. Um, backing up for a second here. Um, so we recently have a letter from DESI. There's been an engagement with them around licensure. You're responding to that letter. That letter is gonna include a bunch of information in it, including um, the licensure status of all the administrators um, who would need to be licensed. It's gonna clarify that. It's going to clarify, as mentioned earlier by Assistant Superintendent Cunningham, um, what happened with School Spring. Uh, and then, as Mr. Demling pointed out, we're, we're uh, essentially going to be, uh, along with whatever dialogue you have around them, what, what our practices are going forward, you're going to get a response from them back that is presumably going to lay out whether their concurrence with both the underlying facts as well as also, uh, and I'm not saying it's an investigation, but I'm saying they're going to acknowledge what you tell them. Mm -hmm. So if they say, you say Mark Jackson's, Licensed, they, well, they told you Mark Jackson's licensed, probably going to nod their heads and say Mark Jackson's licensed, right? So that's what I'm talking about, the letter of that. And then two, whatever pathway they're going to identify going forward, that would be a good practice for us to adhere to going forward, that the administration, to, the district's going to, is going to do, they're going to sort of validate and ratify that. And that that's going to give us a framework, as mentioned earlier, about how we're going to be able to proceed. Um, in addition, people may or may not recall, there was... Um, we hear an Office of Civil Rights complaint that was uh, filed with the Department of Education. Um, we, in fact, have not been notified about that or heard back from it. Um, but I'm, I am—I could say this later in the chair's update, but I'll say it now, that um, the, the responsibility of the committee is clearly to follow whatever path of follow-up oversight and due diligence that falls to us in our role on the school committee. So for example, as um, Ms. Kosinski said a moment ago, we have to, we, I mean, I would argue, I mean, I guess I'm agreeing with her. <laughs> hey, I'm agreeing with you. Um, we, we as the committee owe it to the public and owe it to ourselves and owe it to you to follow up sometime this fall, as we did last November, and hear a thorough presentation about where we are and, and review that. And I think that's important. Um, clearly, if we get back something from OCR or other kinds of uh, re investigatory responses or whatever they are, um, we're, um, as we learn what we learn, the committee is going to have a responsibility to follow up based on what is sent to us and what is provided to us. 
um, that would be true of any situation in which if there were um, if, the, if, there, if there were a uh, complaint filed or some other sort of issue going on, um, the committee would engage in that. I, br I, mention, I bring that up and mention it because, again, there's sort of a fine point to put on the fact, uh, and again, I say this publicly because everything's been so public, um, there are lots of things that have been thrown around as accusations. Um, I'm going to just say, speaking for myself, I actually concur with the opinions that were said earlier but I haven't seen any evidence in my interactions with the leadership to suggest that there is any validity to claims that there was any direct um, bias or other um, motivation uh, in terms of decisions that were made that would warrant uh, a um, review of the decisions that have been made. Um, if, if anything to the contrary comes forward, we would, we would, we would deal with it as we need to. But um, I say this just because I think one of the challenges the committee has when we're getting so many things over the transom, as the old expression goes, or the email inbox as it is currently today, so no one has transoms. Um, my guess is no one even knows what a transom is. Maybe some of you do. Um, but anyways, that, um, that you, you can't respond to every statement that's made if there's no, in fact, any appropriate channel or avenue to re review it appropriately under the law. That was why I would make a distinction that when I, and I get in credit the assistant superintendent to superintendent, um, not only have you been working on the licensure issue since last fall, but on top of that, um, you got a letter from DESE, you're responding to a letter from DESE, where there are things in it you think you need to improve, you're doing so. Um, that's responding appropriately, and the committee itself is also engaging appropriately in, in looking at that and asking questions and wanting to follow up later on. So I think the committee is exercising its appropriate role and judgment in this process. You were doing so as well. Um, I will, I'll call out just the fact that in my mind, going on for a while, but the thing is also our next meeting is going to be about evaluation. We, this probably won't be on the agenda, and then all of a sudden we're in the summer. And so I'm really, I'm extraordinarily uncomfortable with the idea that we have this meeting and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, September or October and people are like, where did this conversation go? So I'm laying it out. I'm welcoming if members of the committee want to do it further in a second as well. That one of the challenges of, of the way in which I think you did handle um, the professional development, professional licensure and practice work that was initiated last summer is I think it's really appropriate. In the context that we discussed earlier about um, staff morale and the overall morale of the district, um, that if, if you have um, uh, questions around individuals who work in the district, I think it's entirely appropriate to handle it in a way in which you're directly engaging with those individuals and trying to resolve um, whatever, you're, whatever you're finding that you need to deal with. In some cases, there are actually strict rules governing how you do that, but in this case, the idea that this is being handled in a way that I recognize for the public was not as public a discussion as it could be. My, my guess is, and you can answer the question if you wanted, but my guess is this was done this way precisely because you're talking about staff or the district and trying to find ways developmentally and appropriately to get them on course. Um, having said that, now that, it, now that it, it is public, I think you know, this is again an example of something where, where um, when I look at where we're going and what we're doing, the fact that you've engaged well, not just last July, but I'm saying right now, you're engaging well and appropriately around how you're doing the work should give people some confidence. What I'd also argue is to the extent that we've been able to be transparent and we're also going to enable and facilitate future conversations where there's also transparency around these things, um, that's the only path forward we have. The only path forward we have is to do these things together and to be transparent, to identify best practices and laws where we can, um, to conduct our roles in ways in which there is appropriate oversight, but there's also, I think, an understanding of the organic nature of the enterprise that we're in, the human-centered nature of the enterprise that we're in. And so, um, you know, as we go forward, I encourage, especially, you know, um, we, you know, we have retreats and retreat planning. I would encourage the committee to think about anything we can do that follows on from the licensure topic, but also the sort of spin-off of other things in which we think about how can we structure and facilitate conversations that can enable us to have confidence and the public have confidence that we're ahead of these conversations as well as we can uh, in the future. 
Um, but I, you know, I thank you for your work. Um, we look forward to responding um, and following up. Um, and I really sincerely want us to do exactly what has been asked of us is in fidelity with these rules, these laws, these best practices, I want to get back to focusing on what we have been doing quite a bit over the last, please, while I've gone, before two, to be fair, other <laughs> members, I don't mean it that way. But at least I'm just saying in my direct personal knowledge of focusing a lot on a multitude of ways in which we can enhance the student experience and family engagement. That's my two cents. Or five cents. Is there anything else on the committee? Okay. Uh, hiring process committee update. This way you want it. Next slide. I think I'm the clicker. Okay. So we. <laughs> that way's better. <laughs> So we had a committee of many individuals, the staff at the ARPS district and the community, who joined together to review our current practices and to make recommendations for future practices. These are some of the members, and I'd like the current members who are here to stand up and join in because they are the ones who will be presenting this work or this information. So we have Lamika McGee, we have DeAndre Henson, and we have Andrea Battle. And they are going to present the rest of the slides. They need a microphone. Make sure you stand yeah. before a microphone, please. So the, process, the purpose of the committee, as mentioned, was to basically review our practices and to just um, make recommendations as to where we could do things better as a district. So I just need a visual cue if you want me to fast step forward a slide. Yeah, I'm, I have a particular slide, but I don't know which is right after this. Uh, he's first. <laughs> so uh, our goal was to create a standing committee with a core membership with um, a diverse group is what we were focused on throughout our entire process. And diverse not only in you know, skin color and race and all those things is that also roles as well. Um, so our thought process was having a core membership and for different, different, um, different hiring processes, um, request members for each school, teachers, paras, um, clerical, food service, custodial, which is also represented into our um, monthly process, and that the membership of um, who those folks are are made public at the beginning of the year, and that individual you know, hiring, you know, hirings, those are made more transparent. But having the broader group made public, we felt would ensure more trust. Um, mm -hmm. Also providing training for that broader group um, on implicit bias, social justice, um, other topics of that nature. And then um, also discuss going forward throughout the year as hiring process to go either have resources or the smaller trainings of some, some sort um, just to make sure everybody's um, together and, and especially in a long year where hiring may happen in different parts of the year that everyone's um, up to date about what we need to do. Um, also, um, in our uh, discussion of the uh, standing committee, we also um, thought about just for you all know, we thought about our big topics were how many should be in there, you know, who should be included in confidentiality, and we thought we tackled that all throughout our, our uh, month in doing that. So one of the big difference when you look at this slide is the creation of the standing committee. Currently, we do not have a committee who is uh, all ready um, to go out there and do the hiring or the screening, and they are not, we don't have people who are trained. So we didn't offer any training previous as to implicit bias or any of the things that DeAndre mentioned. Um, so. This committee is going to be important to have because one of the questions earlier, um, not in this meeting but in a previous meeting, people were saying that, or comment, was that 
<clears throat> they felt the lack, that there was a lack of transparency as to who was on the committee. When we have this now, that we're, and we're going to articulate to each school, each principal, everyone in the district, who the membership is. So let's say we're at Pelham School and we have, let's say, five people. They will know from the beginning who those five people are so that if there's a posting ever for that building, then they will know who may comprise the committee. So that's, that's a big difference, a big change that'll occur. Mm -hmm. So we also took a look at the um, search process and how we can find um, qualified applicants of color. And I would like to say that, you know, we had quite a bit of conversation around qualified. Um, there is a narrative out there that you need a person of color or, you know, and, and that sometimes means looking for someone who may not have the qualifications. And oftentimes, you know, let me just be frank, we're overqualified. Um, and so the idea that, that we cannot find applicants of color, that narrative, we just have to get rid of it. Um, so I just want to say that. Um, and so, but we, we need to think outside of the box. You know, we need to look at some of these EPP programs. If you go on um, DESE, some of the information is right there. We know which EPPs are putting out most educators of color. And so we need to look at those and say, hey, what have you got? So there's opportunity out there. Um, we want to look at six to eight candidates to be invited for uh, interviews. Um, principals should typically be part of the selection committee um, for their respective school, and the superintendent should be involved early in all principal searches, so that's one thing that we discussed. Um, and advance all candidates that are deemed uh, capable of the position, um, and then typically two or three move forward. And this is one thing that, that we looked at if a final, all finalists are rejected after a superintendent interview, that the committee is reconvened. Obviously, it's the superintendent's decision um, what he ultimately decides to do. But I think that reconvening will kind of help the search committee get an understanding, OK, how do we need to move forward? And so we thought that should be part of the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got too far. Yeah, just the other one. Go back. So a change that the, this process brings up is that, as mentioned, typically two to three people are moved forward. And now with this process, anyone who is capable, that the committee is saying is capable of and qualified to do the job, will be advanced. So we're not saying two or three will go for the next round or for the next forum, but whoever, whatever number. So if we have six candidates and we say four of them are qualified, then four of them will move forward to meet with the superintendent and to meet with the community <coughs> forums that take place. And also the early involvement of the superintendent in any of these searches for a principal or director is also a big change, whereas typically, uh, currently the superintendent comes in at the end now he's way in the beginning, he's also in the middle, and he'll be at the end. Can I ask a question? Is that appropriate time? Or? If you want. Um, I just want to make sure I understood the last comment, which was um, if, if we have a failed search um, and we reconvene the committee, is that intended to be like a feedback mechanism to the committee? And, and maybe that's a forum where we didn't, the, the search committee maybe didn't understand the particular skills or the particular, you know, something that was being looked for in the candidates so that the next search, you know, that's, you know, asked about earlier or thought about, is that intended to be a feedback mechanism or did I read that into that comment and it's just a, you know, a, a regrouping? So be before I answer that, I'll ask um, Ms. McGee to answer <laughs> and then I'll just answer again or respond. Um, yes, in a sense, it's meant to be a feedback mechanism. but. Honestly, from what I've seen with our search committees, they're highly competent. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I think that it gives opportunity for each side to kind of say, okay, this is, this is my position on this, and these are the reasons why I made my decision. And for the search committee, you know, whatever points that they need to bring forward, to bring those points forward and come to some type of a, agreement. 
um, even if they don't necessarily like the decision, they're in agreement that we're going to move forward with this decision, you know, or we're, they're going to we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And so it gives it, it gives opportunity for the search committee and the superintendent to kind of have a conversation, um, and then the superintendent ultimately makes a decision. Thank you. So with our current practice, the superintendent does not have to reconvene the committee to explain his decision. The, his decision is just what it is, and it stands. Mm -hmm. So this gives that opportunity, as Ms. McGee mentioned, for that conversation to take place. So there, there's a lot more that we talked about, um, such as criterias and, and um, many other things. But we also looked at how are we going to assess this process, right? So we're putting this, these things into place. We're saying we're trying to be consistent or we're working at being consistent across all the schools in the district. And we want to make sure that we are doing what we say we're doing. So at the end of each um, interview session or search, there will be evaluations that will go out to the committee members to just ask them for feedback on the process. Also, our committee, you saw the membership, we, when we have searches, there will be one person at least from that membership who will sit as a silent observer to then go back and say, okay, I noticed that we have been doing this, or I noticed that this did not take place in this search, mm -hmm. so let's make sure that we are being consistent in doing what we say. And then once again, we're going to always have places where we have to revise and, and change things, and, and, and where right now we're thinking that this may make sense, but once it's in practice, we realize that it, it can't happen or needs to be tweaked a bit. So we're going to always look for those revisions to take place. Uh, during admin week, I will be working with our committee members who um, will hopefully self-select to join me um, <laughs> to train administrators and directors so that they know what we're looking for. And a good thing about the committee members is that they're one individual at least from every school except the high school, but we can always go back and train the high school members so that when there's a search in each school, there's a committee member who can look and say, yes, this is taking place correctly, or excuse me, principal, whomever, this is how it should look according to the process that we've put in place. And um, also communication is going to be sent out to all the staff so that those <coughs> who are um, observing the process will know exactly what they should be seeing. <coughs> So this is just a summary. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, a survey will be sent to all staff members just to find out for your building, what are you looking for in individuals who join your staff? Mm -hmm. Once that survey is sent out, if a position occurs or opens up in that building, we'll, we can use some of the information from that survey to then create the job description or tweak the current job description to basically put in the unique characteristics of the school and what the staff is looking for for the school. Then when that position is posted, the committee members are called to action basically. They come together, they do any kind of retraining, any kind of conversations that need to take place, they will come together and have those conversations. As mentioned, um, this is a continual process, so we will continue consistently have conversations and there'll be lots of communication around the process, whether it's with the search committee or with the community as to what we're looking for to happen with our, our district. Also, um, as mentioned, the superintendent will be earlier in the process, especially for the hiring of a principal or director. And then the other thing is that there's some positions that when we hire, we don't have them currently take undertake a task. I know teachers go in and they do mock lessons, um, but now we're saying that every position that we hire for, there is a possibility of a task that that person will undertake. So let's say it's in food service, whether it's a, a general worker creating a menu, or let's say it's, um, it's a paraprofessional working with a, a group of students, they're in that room working with the students as part of their task so that we can get an idea of how they will do in the uh, uh, 
in their, their possible role or future role if they're hired. So that's also new that every position will have a task. Okay. And then finally, mm -hmm. I don't want us to lose sight of this, but you know, at the end of the day, the superintendent, according to Desi, is the one who makes all the, the final decision. So, any questions? Yeah, um, so thank you for this. Very um, informative. I, I like the emphasis on increasing the search committee superintendent communication. Um, a couple of implementation, implementation questions I don't think I quite understood. So the standing committee, you're talking about having one search committee for all positions that would be the same members? Is that right? Is that what, is that what a standing committee is? Committees standing in each school, each school, and people will volunteer to be in them. And we're going to try to use the lottery, you know, the um, what is it called? It's the lottery. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like, and it, it comes out that way. And um, there's a training for them. And what happens is, people, the more people know, the better off they ask questions. And that's the whole idea. And also, the more transparency because they're in on the staff of the school in which they're going to hire. So that was the whole idea, the standing committee. So you don't have to gr grab people at the last minute, but you have people who are trained. And you know, trained by the superintendent, the, super the assistant superintendent, trained so that they know what they're looking for, they know what they're looking at, you know, and, then, and the people who have certain requirements, basic requirements, mm -hmm. you know. Only one of them is licensed, everything else, you know, what you know, degree, whatever, what experience, and that kind of thing, so, so that it's clear at the end of the process or the middle of it. Thank you. And there, there are also core members of this standing committee. So it may be someone from HR. It would be the director of family engagement. It would be the student services person. So the core members are, are listed there. Mm -hmm. And then people from the other schools. So I'm still not quite getting it. I'm sorry. So you have the core members that are, are maybe members of all the school standing committees. And then you have staff, say, at Pelham that are on the Pelham standing committee. Does this also include community members? And if so, is it the same community member for every position for a year? Is that, I'm, try, I'm trying to understand where the community members come in. And, and one of my concerns is that, um, you know, sometimes you get great community members and they're awesome. Sometimes they're not so great. And I'm not going to talk about why because I've been in a number of search committees and I totally respect the confidentiality of that process. But that can affect a number of positions. So I just, I'm trying to understand the logistics of how the community gets on those, because they seem like pretty influential committees to be on. Okay. So, we're not asking for one community member from each school. So let's say we'll use Pelham again. Let's say we send out the request for whomever is interested in joining the committee, and we get five or 10 community members. Those community members, all 10 of them, if they're recommended and, and, and approved of, right? All 10 of them will be trained. And so let's say Pelham is hiring a teacher, one or two of them, because typically there, there's a number that the uh, group has mentioned as to who would constitute a membership in each, com in each search process. So let's say there's one community member. So we have 10 to choose from. Right? That list of 10 will go out to let everyone know who the possible 10 members would be, and then we'll choose one for this search today for the teacher. Let's say next week we need to hire a food service worker. We still have 10 to choose from, so we can go back to that group of 10 and say, okay, one of you community members, because your schedule might change, right, as a community <clears throat> member. So we'll have one. Another one, maybe, could be the same one. We have 10 to choose from who are trained. Thank you. Okay. 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 Other questions? Um, oh, please. Four questions. Yeah, yeah, please. Four questions. I would, oh, okay. yeah. well, four questions. I would like to just to point out, when we say you know, new process and, and this process, I would say evolve probably the best word for it. Um, you know, I think that the staff that we have in this community I think either been here a long time or, or brand new. I think, you know, I guess the previous process, for lack of a better term, has you know 
from those uh, search processes and interviews have given us great staff. Mm -hmm. However, I do think this is an evolution of what maybe should have been going on ongoing over and over throughout the years to arrive at this point. And so, uh, and especially many of the ideas that we did have throughout the, the, the time we looked over it were derivative of the old process. It, but just using those foundations and saying, where can we improve on this? Where can we improve on that? Does that still make sense here for the current environment? Um, so I think this is probably more of an evolution of the process. It's, um, for those maybe concerned that we're, you know, you know taking everything away and, and throwing it out, out the window, it's more of just an evolution of what we already do. Um, so I think that's just put that out there. That it's more of an evolution. Um, I appreciate the, uh, I guess, creativity and dedication that's gone into this entire process of developing. Um, I think a lot of these are really great ideas. I, you know, I, I have similar, I guess, concerns to the ones that Mr. Demling raised just in terms of the logistics, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that it's a, it's a good enough idea that you'll, you'll, you know, you'll come up with what you need to. The only thing I would, I would ask is, um, Probably just because I, I recently went through several rounds of union negotiations with our <laughs> uh, union staff, you know, and, and we arrived at different places with the contracts, which are all great places. But it strikes me that now, if we're proposing a standing committee that consists of, uh, you know, educators and others who will be regularly involved in additional work, um, just we want to make sure that it's not somehow adding an extra burden, right, of time to their their schedules. So. And you know, in, in trying to be conscious of the fact that we heard back from a lot of educators about how stretched their times are, um, so it's just something to consider. You know, maybe there's another creative solution that gets put on top of it, um, or maybe it's a simple conversation with you know the unions. I'm not sure, um, but I just want to make sure that we you know we're sort of going into this eyes wide open, considering that we have made some staff cuts and that there have been some changes that have taken place because of budget reasons that we're not adding another layer of, of burden on, on folks. Um, it's one thing to have volunteers that come together, you know, every once in a while. It's another to have somebody, you know, a group of people that are constantly being called on. And I'm hoping that it's not constant because I'm hoping that our staff are retained and that they're happy <laughs> and that we're not constantly hiring, right? Um, but just, you know, again, something to just think about, you know, as, as we're moving forward. And I just wanted to note that I, I really like the idea of having a silent observer um, in meetings. Um, you know, I, I uh, had come from a background when I was working in graduate school on a sort of conflict resolution and you know the, the idea of having what they call the dove in the room is a really important concept of just somebody who observes and doesn't participate in any of the negotiations or any of the back and forth but just someone who is you know quietly observing what's happening and able to provide some comments is just a really uh, you know I think uh, mature and and um, important role for you know for for people to play because it's you taking that person out from the milieu of where they would normally be when they're doing something like this, you know, and um, hopefully capturing some really important data and sharing that back with the group. So I really like that idea. I also just want to say that I really like the idea of having the superintendent involved throughout the process and for a reconvening to happen afterwards, right? Because I feel like, you know, communication, again, is so critically important and understanding for, you know, from, for the community as well as the staff where everyone is at every step of the way is also really important, right? And so, you know, when Ms. Cunningham provides that leadership of this is where we want to be, this is the kind of position that we're hiring, and then we have, a, you know, the search process that gets put into place, and then the superintendent is sort of at the tail end of all of that, it becomes really difficult to share that process with everybody and for it to make sense to everyone, right? And without there being any, you know, sort of hurt feelings or, you know, frustration or all of those different things. So. Hopefully something like that, uh, involving the superintendent more frequently and having people or a person who can kind of sit on the periphery and, and watch what's going on and provide some, you know, some feedback to everybody will be really beneficial to this, uh, this search process for all of our staff moving forward. Oh, and one last thing that I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. Um, just to, you know, I think there's a, there was such great care taken in, in putting together this search process committee. Um, that I'm hopeful that if, if we were to create other committees uh, or one standing committee or whatever the iteration ends up being, that the same amount of care gets put into that as well, right? And that we're selecting, you know, people based on diversity of perspectives and opinions and experience within the district so that we're not uh, having sort of the same usual suspects making the same kinds of decisions. So the 
The assistant superintendent and superintendent wanted to respond, but then after that, Ms. Bitsy. Oh, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> make a comment on something that you said, where one of the, the things that we talked about was that um, the super, when, when we have the superintendent join at the end, then it's our candidate that, uh, well, yeah, our candidate that we're sending to the superintendent. But once he is there throughout the process, then it is collectively our candidate that we're moving forward through each step. So that was something that the committee mentioned that we'd like to see that happen more, more often than us presenting someone to the superintendent. And just very briefly, um, Ms. Cunningham has set that up for the current middle school interim principal search process. Um, that, I mean, you know, all these are things are happening, uh, you know, to a certain extent concurrently, but that has been um, that aspect as well as others. But that one in particular, because I can speak to it, has been set up already for the current process. Um, well, I'd first just like to thank you all for putting in the time, especially at this really busy time of the school year. Um, I know. It's a big, big group of you, and I just, you know, for those who aren't here as well, thank you very much. Um, my question is just trying to get clarity on when certain pieces of this process come into play. So I understand the standing committee is going to be responsible for all of the potential hires that a school could ha have. Is that correct? So, because you mentioned, like, the food director, the teachers, paras, and then... Um, the piece about having the tasks involved, that's for all of the hiring. But obviously, I don't think the superintendent is involved in every single hiring. So that's just going to be assistant principals, directors. And so the other thing I was wondering is the bit about bringing in everyone capable of doing a job to go on to the, as a finalist. Could I get some clarity on that? So um, I guess my question is, is that only, again, for the assistant principal positions, the kind of more um, administrator, higher up administrator positions, or is that also going to be true for positions where I'd assume there'd be a much bigger potential pool of candidates just because the, um, you know, there are more people licensed as teachers out there than, necess than um, assistant principals, for example? So I'll answer part of it by okay. saying that this is a evolving, as, as DeAndre mentioned, process, right? Um, the superintendent involvement would mostly be for the directors and the principals. The principals are usually the ones who hire the assistant principals, deans, teachers, and such. So the superintendent involvement in the hiring of a teacher is just when the principal makes the recommendation and the teacher is brought forward. Now to say that we would hire everyone brought forward or everyone's going to move forward, not at the teacher level, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> so, That's all I wanted to make sure that we're not opening the door to just a huge amount of no, um, no. It's, that's more time. at the um, when we talk about uh, we we looked at some of the failed searches, mm -hmm. and we said you know there was one search where there was only one person left in the candidate pool that the committee wanted to bring forward but then it was considered a failed search because there was only one person. Therefore, we're saying if there is one person, then it doesn't need to be a failed search. Oh, I see. So um, we can look at hiring or the, the superintendent appointing that one person. And we, we talked about a whole lot of other things to go with the possible hiring of that one person, such as surveys after a year to see how that person is doing. But we're, we're looking at ways to reduce the possibility of having a failed search. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kastensen, Mr. Dillon. I just have a quick question. Um, so I agree with Ms. Ordonez. Like I, there are so many wonderful ideas in here. And... Um, I guess I do have a couple of questions about like the screening committee composition and everything, but I trust we'll work that out. So, what happens from here? Um, do you do you, do we look at this again, or is this going to be implemented right now, or how how does this process work from from here on? So there are parts that will be implemented as early as tomorrow. Okay, great. <laughs> um, because we have a search taking place tomorrow, and then we will come back and and discuss what took place. Maybe find places where we didn't think about something happening that took place, right? And then the training will take place in August. 
So there are people who were on the committees who have mentioned to their principals, oh, when you're doing your search now, these are the things you need to do. But to make sure it's consistent, we're training everyone in August. And then we're, we're articulating that information to all staff at the beginning of the school year so that it's moving forward. We're making sure that this is happening. Wonderful. So just a constant process of mm -hmm. organic learning and development. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I'm just a lot better after all the clarifying questions, so thank you. Um, one thing I think to think about as you kind of evolve the details, this, so this notion of advancing all the capable candidates, I think that can, there are some situations that, that could be a little problematic logistically. I, I'm just thinking of a couple of um, principal searches that I was involved in just as a member of the public, in which um, an assistant principal searches where um, the finalists are brought out to the community and they have like a night where they can meet the people at the school and they do a Q and A. And I remember it was it was a lot to get out to those events, especially when you have kids, but you want the community engagement. I remember uh, we had one search with two, and that felt like a lot, like two nights that we're setting aside everything and going and meeting. We had one with three, that felt like too much. I can't imagine what five or six or seven they're, they're just capable, so we advanced them as finalists, candidates would be for those types of positions. So just something to think about in terms of like the logistics. You know, it's not, not for every position requires that level of public engagement at the very end, but, but some do. Um, and I just wanted to comment briefly because it was brought up. Um, I'm glad that, um, that this committee has focused on, will continue to focus on how to increase um, the diversity of our, our workforce and, um, and, and, and being proactive about it. Um, you know, the, I, I see one of the core problems, um, you know, because this theme of di trying to diversify our, our workforce proactively is, touches a lot of the things we're talking about tonight, as, as one of, uh, it's, I think of it as an opportunity gap, that, you know, income inequality disproportionately affects people of color. Therefore, educational opportunity disproportionately affects people of color. Therefore, the number of graduates that we have uh, from our institutions is disproportionate uh, in that respect. And so, um, it requires us not just saying, oh, we'd like a diverse workforce, we'll see whoever applies to us. We have to be proactive about, um, about recruitment. That's why recruitment is, is such a big point of that. So I, I know you're already on top of that. You, you understand those themes, and I, I just want to say I appreciate that being a, a core value of the, of the search process committee. So, oh. I just, one quick comment is, um, I think we mentioned it last time, too. I, I appreciate the amount of time the committee members put into this, and I just want to take the opportunity to at least thank a few of you in person. So I, I think it's, it was very valuable work and I appreciate the effort you guys put in. Yeah, and I, I, think, um, I think it's great. And um, one of the things I'll highlight that has been discussed earlier, uh, I like the fact that by setting certain processes in place and doing them in a uniform way, but a uniform way that's backed by sort of a logic model of why you would set something up a certain way. You know, like having having identified core members of a team uh, for a standing committee, doing that by building, having it by function, as well as other kind of stakeholders, <coughs> then also having training involved in it. I mean, so there's an expectation, I think, that, and then obviously you built in continuous improvement and sort of learning from it. But I just think that um, <coughs> even if, Previously, in previous practices, there has been a general uniformity across search committees in the district, and my guess is there probably has been. There's been more in common with how the search committees have been set up than not. I think calling out the, these features and then setting, instituting both sort of policies around it, but also then working in the functional practices, like the, the Dove, as you were commenting it, um, into that, into that uh, work stream, into the work that's being done, I think will hopefully not only improve the quality of it, which I think should certainly happen, and it would for anything, right? I think anything we do, if we start building and institutionalizing it, doing continuous learning and training and stuff like that, you're going to prove anything somebody does by doing that. But also I think you're going to build lots of, co of um, confidence, both within, within the district members of the professional staff, and then also publicly as well, I and mean, well, how does that work anyways? How did that decision happen? Who does this stuff anyways? Um, so I just think there's a lot in it that's really good. And it, I think it shows the quality of the work that um, the, the process committee, all of you did, and everyone else who was involved in it did. Are there other comments before we move on? Oh, sure. Uh, 
So uh, you had mentioned at the end of your, your um, discussion about uh, what you liked and had thoughts about about the um, just not having the usual suspects in the room mm -hmm. a lot. I think that that you know, phrase or iteration of that phrase was brought many times um, throughout. Um, and I do think that the reason why uh, not just our you know, the skeleton of the process, but also you know, the process itself um, was to reduce a lot of what we, what we, we, when we discussed things, we hear a lot of, well, why did this happen in this one compared to what this happened? Or why was that person that again with that person? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, a lot of just trust you know, in the internal group, mm -hmm. uh, um, and a lot of trust in the grouping itself. Um, I think that one of our, you know, one of our core things we got out of it was that we want to have a process. It's a, it's a working document. And it's a it's a working thing um, that we hope it's you know as it implemented in strong results, but we are in um, no way thinking this is infallible <laughs> um, in, in any way as any process is. Um, but also more involvement as if it's in, you know, implemented year in year out, because um, people talk and and you know people talk a lot and that. If we have a you know, uh, example, you know, a lower membership from teachers one year who are volunteering because they may have seen a different process before and say maybe not this year, and they see it happen. The next year, we may have a different pool of teachers who volunteer, or a different you know, pool of paraeducators who volunteer, just because of the confidence level and um, the invitation itself to the involvement may go up. Hmm. And so, I, I my you know, thought about this is that I think as it goes on, that as you know, year by year by year. We may have similar people who have volunteered, but I don't think the usual suspect lines would be thrown out, you know, so easily without someone else saying, "Well, I was on that process, or I did that process, or this person did that process," and it really wasn't the usual suspects. So someone knew this person. We just, even this committee, I would say this committee, um, for those no, for a lot who aren't here, this committee we, we um, made a. Uh, Suit food service people, mm -hmm. parents from different schools, mm -hmm. teachers, you know, former teachers, um, uh, facilitated by the former administration. And so we had a lot of voices, perspectives, and experiences that were brought out you know, in the time that we had. But also, I think just from their involvement in the, in the committee is, was a good snapshot of what I feel the confidence level will be as people you know, start to see more and more in this committee. So just to you know, put your point out for you know, the usual suspects. Um, and also training, I think, um, will ensure a lot of the trust as well. Um, you know, I know we do um, safety training for a lot of the staff here, right? And part of that is so everyone's on board and trusts the next person beside them that they're going to do a, a, a logical and good job of what they're doing. And so I think for staff um, trust, Knowing that the people who are in the room are trained and not just picked, or you know, the person that they never heard of before, or a person who thought they couldn't do this is trained, also gives us a sense of um, trust amongst the staff. So, just want to put that out to your, your point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Without further questions, we will move on. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, approved clerical awards is the next item. Uh, yes? No, no, I'm sorry. I was going to introduce, but that would happen. I'm trying to look for my paper on this. Do you it's, have paper on this? Yeah, it's yeah. in the packet. <laughs> I saw you looking. That's why okay, I, thanks. my hand went up. That's why I was, I thought you were going to tell me where the paper was. I, I was could excited. have done that as well. <laughs> um, it's in your packet, is the answer. <laughs> You're introducing an hour. Yeah, so it's okay. two separate votes, one for the region and one for Amherst. Um, every year, as per contract, we have uh, clerical media awards. Um, there's a uh, recommendations come from anyone in the organization, and then when uh, propose, yeah, I guess, recommendations. And they're reviewed by Wistos Moreland and one school committee member. I'm trying to think who. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan, uh, for the regional level. And um, and uh, I'll speak to it in superintendent update, but these were actually uh, celebrated and awarded last night uh, at an employee recognition event. Um, 
but I think I can maybe just because there's still some people who are here for an agenda item, mm -hmm. I'll wait till they're perhaps done with their agenda item and, and give it a little more uh, long longer description than I would now. But there's one motion for just to be clear because there's it's a joint meeting right I, now. I've already figured this out. Yes, <laughs> that's why I put the gavel between, between me us, and yeah. Anastasia Ardonias. <laughs> collaboration or chair is the yeah. most important point in there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the first item is a regional motion, which I would entertain now. I move to approve annual clerical awards in the amount of five hundred dollars each for Marianne Jean Yuck. And Gignac. sorry, Gignac. Gignac. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry. Linda Kirkpatrick. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion is read. Signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. Thank you. And for Amherst, I'll take a motion. I move to approve annual clerical awards in the amount of $500 each for Karen Bono and Beverly Jenks. Great. Is there second. a second? Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh. Great. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> 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 I was definitely hey, Mr. Right? Sullivan, you were discounted. I was so in favor that I got to walk around and congratulate them. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're up next. So um, I think that concludes the business for the Amherst School Committee, and I will take another motion. Mr. Dunley? I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. And a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Great. And so now we are on to approval of the minutes of May 22nd, 2018. Yes. So I was wondering, with the chair and the committee's permission, if we could advance the regional library update since there's three staff members who are here to speak to that um, and the hour is late and their next morning hour is quite early. That's cool with me. But let's in the future, let's, let's you and I work harder to not keep doing this at meetings <laughs> Sorry. and actually think about when staff are going to be presenting yeah. and just, uh, just like presumptively move them up the agenda. I tried to cue you, but I, it we're, was, not, we're not doing no, a good no, job I mean, with cueing. I don't want to cue it. <laughs> yeah. I want to just actually move them up the agenda yeah. when it's going to be like this. Yeah. Otherwise, I always feel like I'm a jerk or something, like like I'm trying to make them stay late or something yeah. as chair, and I'm not. I don't like, think I'm, I'm happy to work way. with you to yeah. move them up the agenda yes. without any, no, any, any no objection. Well, I was no, going to say no objection, objection without objection. Uh, so ordered. Uh, regional library update, right? And there's a handout that was not in your packet, but was in front of you. Um, it was on your. It was on the oh, table. Yeah, so it has uh, black and red oh, writing on the front. So, and just make sure. Thank obviously, you. I'm sure you will. But just introduce yourself when you come to the microphone yep, yep. to speak. Yep, yep. Oh, and um, thank you very much. yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for your patience too. <laughs> It's also field day tomorrow, and I'm on the um, staff <laughs> team, and it might be free. So um, <laughs> as we have introduction, my name is Lanny Blackman. Lanny rhymes with Danny, and I am finishing up my first year as the librarian at Fort River Elementary School. Um, and I'm here to kind of update you and celebrate all of us on um, the leadership that our libraries take and your leadership on supporting um, our school libraries across the region and um, the Amherst Public Schools. Um, and I have with me here <coughs> Leslie Lomson, who has been the librarian here at um, the high school um, and is unfortunately retiring. But the good news is that we have um, Ella Stalker here also, who is our final candidate for um, uh, the position here. Um, so we just wanted to, the packets that we um, gave to you ahead of time and have here give you kind of some snapshots of um, the libraries at all of our schools. Um, and we, we know, and it seems that you know too, that um, strong school libraries are essential for all of our students in terms of their learning. Um, just a few weeks ago, some of my sixth graders presented to um, Representative Goldstein, oh. Solomon Goldstein Rose, um, <laughs> on the importance of information literacy and the state's need to get involved in curriculum around fake news. Um, so our students know this too. Um, do you wanna give a little about what's in the packet well, or what we have here? Well, I also just wanna say, uh, Lanny has taken a position on a statewide mass. <laughs> Lanny is now an executive director on the Massachusetts School Library Association Board, and so 
she's really pushing for this advocacy, which is why we're happy to sit here late at night. Um, I want to say that uh, recently I was interviewed for uh, about the library program, and this library program is very strong because of so many different components of this school. Uh, the fact that throughout the 10 years of massive budget cuts, you have continued to support school libraries and school librarians is, um, and paraprofessionals is really a tribute to how committed you are. But the other pieces that make all of this work include a strong IS department. There, our libraries are so dependent on technology. Um, our faculty who are so integrated into this library, all the libraries, um, programming. So you can walk in here on any given day and we might have to be full with three classes. So a lot of what we've given you is just a snapshot of all three levels of libraries and how much is going on behind the scenes. And it's not because of me or Lanny, and we'll introduce Ella in a moment, but it's because of all these different pieces that support the libraries, the library programming, and you. And so we want to say thank you. And it's not, um, it's hard, especially in the rural areas, for schools to hold on to strong libraries. And, uh, and we here have made it happen, all of us. And so um, your students, our students, our children, thank all of you because they come out so much better for it. Um, I have a prop. I don't know whether I should do that now. One second, one second. I just want to um, uh, return to the legacy for just a moment. I've had the privilege to work with um, librarians across the district for many years who um, Janice Wilkenbright, who you may know, um, Leslie Lamison, who's here, Elaine Donahue, Susan Wells. Um, and um, and we do have this strong legacy. Um, and on that, I want to acknowledge that Leslie has recently received an award from um, our state association, the Massachusetts School Library Association, um, for a, her lifetime achievement, which she has spent her lifetime achievement in school libraries here at the high school. Um, and her leadership has been on the school level as well as on the state level. Um, and. And so that is indicative of your continued support. Um, and so moving sort of to the future, the last page in the packet is um, from our national association, which highlights um, the ways that administrators um, can partner with school libraries. And one of the reasons why we're here is because we are excellent collaborators. We're collaborating with you all the time, even if you don't know it. And so a lot of our work isn't visible, right? Because we're collaborating. And so we wanna make visible what you all are doing and what we're doing together. Um, and this is, this document really is pushing us into the future with the new um, national standards that we have um, and highlighting ways that we can continue to work together. So on that, um, and I also want to do a little shout out for the page about the Amherst Public School Libraries. There's a link to a video um, of our students talking about what they learned. Um, but um, <laughs> so the, beyond the numbers, right? Um, but so on that future note, so Ellis Docker is also a 2004 graduate of Amherst Regional High School, so strong libraries produce strong librarians. <laughs> <laughs> very true. <laughs> and our teachers seem very excited to have her coming home. Um, and so I borrowed a little prop from Ms. Haygood, one of our... The microphone. Oh, you've got to walk in here. Closer to the microphone. I borrowed a little prop from Ms. Haygood. It's a relay baton. Right? right. <laughs> 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 um, uh, that's it, I think. Right? Do you have anything else to say? No. I can talk more. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I'm very excited to be rejoining the Amherst School community. Um, I went to Shutesbury Elementary School and then the middle school and high school, and um, it has always been sort of my hope to come back to this area and to eventually make it back to the school in some way or another. I did not necessarily imagine when I graduated from high school that it would be in the role of librarian that I'd be returning, but I have so many wonderful memories of my learning experiences in this school, and they have, it's so shaped who I am as a person, and I'm really thrilled to be able to continue that legacy that started for me with Janice Wilkenbright and that Leslie has continued in the library 
over the past 10 years um, and that I will hopefully be able to continue for many, many years to come. So um, I look forward to working with all of you in the future. And yeah, we're just, I'm very excited to be part of this really wonderful team of librarians who are, you know, uh, all sort of really incredible professionals and um, have already taught me so much. And I've only been sort of officially on the hiring list for the past four weeks. So <laughs> uh, it speaks a lot to how um, welcoming this community is and how welcoming this school and district is. So um, thank you all for your work in making that possible. I just said I have one last thing to say, <laughs> which is that I'm not sure that this comes out through the numbers, but I think that um, one of our strengths as librarians across the district and um, one of the reasons why Ella is the final candidate is that um, we are looking to create library users and information literate students out of all of our students. And so we're particularly working towards those students who don't see themselves as readers or don't see themselves as belonging in our libraries for all of the different reasons that we've been discussing in terms of hiring processes and licensure. And so, um, so it's really great that we're all on the same team here. <laughs> I, I find it incredibly exciting to hear from you and I'm so glad that you're here tonight and that you stuck with it and also that um, by sticking with it and then being so excited about your work um, it's like my guess is if it were two hours earlier you know the the decibel level and the excitement <laughs> level would be even higher um, and it's high it's high enough as it is to be impressive but also just I mean I I um, I'm I've always been obsessed with libraries and since I mean I remember being when I was a little kid being talked about, I, I learned of this place where actually you were allowed to go in and explore and find words and pictures and books and that they'd even let, them, let you take them home and explore them. And I know that there, it's one of the most special ways that you can engage and, and, and touch children in, in ways that, that sometimes you're not able to do educationally. And it, there are different modes you can do that. And so I think it's incredibly special but also just seeing, having heard the um, in-depth presentation some point in the last year on the high school library, um, knowing how absolutely exceptional it is, but then hearing, what I like about hearing about a community of librarians in collaboration mm -hmm. is, um, you know, I would have a great pleasure if we went library by library and saw um, presentations about what you're doing, <laughs> because I'm sure it's all exceptional um, but it was just deeply impressive in the ways in which you're thinking creatively about what 21st century learning is and then how to, how to think about how students engage with information, but also then how you can leverage technology in creative ways to improve the ability either to move through information, organize it, and engage with it is just really exceptional. So it's just, it's just wonderful, wonderful work. Um, Mr. Delming. Yeah, um, so yes, thank you. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> My kids love libraries, so I've always been really, really into the concept. And I, I love, I love this, this, this guide here you have from the American Association of School Librarians. I love the idea that, that libraries can be and should be a, a central part of modern education, not just because we have a nostalgic idea and, and warm fuzzy when we think of somebody behind the desk that helps you find a book. And, it's, and not just because, oh, we'll make everything digital now, and it's just, it's just you sit at a computer. It's, um, the thing that really caught me about this summary is the idea of that you're empowering and fostering collaboration. Like when I think really big picture about what goes into, um, what resources and, and factors go into education working, m money and budget is obviously a big factor, right? But teacher collaboration, when I read opinion pieces, when I read research, the ability for teachers to collaborate and for, for different students to collaborate, to make those connections that you may not have even been aware of were possible is is, is really important, and it can often be in a cost-neutral way, <laughs> right? So if you have librarians that are in the thick of being able to do that skill and bring people together, that just, it just supercharges the education, and I get, I get so excited when I see people who get that about libraries and, and are excited to do it, so thank you. It's really exciting that you get that. <laughs> <laughs> other, other comments or questions? Just that my kids miss Miss Lanny at Leverett Elementary School. Ah. <laughs> uh -huh. And my kids are quite thrilled to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to visit on the 25th. Superintendent? <laughs> I mean, you can, I was just going to make a closing comment, but you were about to say something. Yeah, I was about to say superintendent. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, I was calling on you. I'm doing my job, dude. Tonight. I'm facilitating <laughs> the meeting.
Um, no, I just want to thank the three of you for coming in tonight. And I think to the point about how central libraries have been and are in our district, I think uh, I think for any of you who do either because you're a parent or just come to visit the schools, our libraries are never empty. Um, you know, Mr. Nakajima and I had an opportunity, as you know, to we had a, we had a meeting uh, last week, uh, which was somewhat awkwardly timed to be in the Fort River Library because of the being the school day and. I get distracted by children, right? That's a, probably a good thing in my role, right? But, um, but maybe too much. Uh, and, you know, the whole walls thing is the challenge at the library at Fort River. But it was just amazing how many students were streaming through, as I'm trying to focus on this meeting, picking up a book, delivering a book. Can I have help finding this book? And there was no class scheduled when we were there. It wasn't like, oh, there was a, a fifth grade class that came in for their, you know, quote unquote specials time. It was just the routine uh, level of traffic uh, the good traffic that we like and that happens and that's true in all of our schools in the district I mean, it's true certainly in this building where you have multiple classes and multiple individual students going on and I think um, they're not there because someone told them to go there they're there because the libraries are a central place and how they think about the schools so I really just want to thank uh, all of you for your work past present and future um, and I uh, just appreciate for how meaningful it is uh, for our students to have that experience as, as a routine part of their school day and, and it's really um, I, I'm not sure and I think I'm glad they don't realize how privileged they are that not all communities have school libraries that are that central in the academic life of, of K-12 students and we do so I just want to share my appreciation for that and for sticking it out till 10 o'clock it's been an honor actually to work for this school district and just know how supportive we are as librarians and libraries and the support for our students it's it's a it's a privilege so thank you for a thank great you. run <laughs> <laughs>
something along the lines of apparently how LeBron James felt in some of these games and near the end of the series. It's like you just it's the fourth quarter. You have, a, you have a much better team. Much better team. We do. We <laughs> That's actually very I true. I didn't know yeah. I should be insulted. Or <laughs> it's like how Kevin Durant might feel. I didn't mean game, I'm right? LeBron James. I meant sort of. I didn't mean that at all. I meant sort of like. I meant sort of generically. It's like. You know, he was gassed. <laughs> you could tell. I can't follow any of these references. He made it a little too obvious, though, don't you think? What? All right, are we back? Run? Are we all back? <laughs> We're, all, We're almost all back. <laughs> did Ron, um, not, did you? What? Ron Nino, did you know that did you, he was not coming tonight? I mean, had he communicated with you? I didn't know that, but I mean, I I, we, we knew it as he didn't arrive. <laughs> that's what, that's what, I wondered if he had communicated It became that increasingly in apparent as, as the question. evening went on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, well, yeah. Um, that was my question. How did you know? It's 10 o'clock. We just We are back to order. Um, approval of the minutes of May 22nd, 2018. We have a chance to take a look at this. I'll move to approve the minutes of Tuesday, May 22nd. Yes, that's the right date. Yes. Okay, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, so. I, I was in attendance, not absent, and I am listed in the in attendance, but also in the absent column. <laughs> okay, that would be one good edit. Oh, Oh, do you need a paper is copy since you're offline over no, there? No, it was just okay. getting logged in. Okay. Because it's not letting. Yeah. Okay. Well, you guys good? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Dillon? Uh, small typo. It references policy B D E H. It's actually policy B E D H. The beginning paragraph of the. Yes. Uh, prior to public comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, B E D H. Anything else further? Yes? Just a tiny uh, typo at the bottom of um, page three, I guess. Uh, paragraph F, except this. There's two dollar signs in front of the There sure is. 10, That's okay. a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything further? I also just noted yeah. we have EFF. Oh. oh, here we go. Here we go. So presumably, except gifts, gifts should also be G. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Anything else? Seeing nothing else, all those in favor of approving the minutes of May 22nd, 2018 as amended, signify by raising your hand. Uh, any days? Abstentions? One abstention from Kessenson. Uh Otherwise, the minutes are approved. Um, Okay. Do we have any subcommittee updates? None are required. Mr. Dumley. Yes. Uh, uh, we had a CPAC meeting. Um, talked about a lot of things, but one thing particular to the region is we're evolving how we want our student rep uh, mm -hmm. to be here and the process for that. Mm -hmm. um, opinion was expressed that we should think about uh, how to incorporate voice from Summon Academy. Um, so I don't know whether the superintendent is thinking about how that, or the chair or whatever. But just a bullet item on the agenda as yeah. we're going through the protocol. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, different suggestions. Maybe there's some way in which they work with the student council. Maybe um, there can be a summit academy at the rep, student rep at the CPAC meetings. This is always a school mm. committee meeting there. Some different ideas that, that sure. we just began the discussion about. But nice. so Great. I want to put like that, that on the radar. Great. Uh, anything else in the subcommittees? Yes. There's, it's not exactly in the subcommittees, but it's something related to a prior uh, item, which was reorganizing. And I yeah. just wanted to raise that we didn't talk about Union 26, which is now that um, I think Pelham and all the towns have done, have gone through, mm -hmm. Pelham went through its, its votes, right, for its election. We did, yep, yeah, we reorganized. Um, we so we just have to, you know, reorganize the Union 26 as well. Okay. Um, but I think that's probably for a later meeting. Okay. Okay. It has to be on the agenda anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, actually, I'll hold my comment. This is a regional meeting, and, and I think. Okay, I'll, I'll, so we'll, 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 what we'll do is that's a. 
put that on your list. We'll put that it's, on our I've list. I've got it on my list. Of Maybe the chair of Union 26 will put that on her list. Yeah, already there. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're done with super subcommittee update. Oh, actually, you know, with, with, with the exception, maybe this is supposed to be a chair's report, that um, we have a list of subcommittees. I think what we want to do is send out a, um, an email, Deb have to send out an email to folks asking them to respond in, via email with any preference for subcommittee assignments and to do so um, prior to the 26th. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Great. And, and again, if anyone wants to know about subcommittees, they can ask me, ask their colleagues, ask uh, Deb Westmoreland. Um, anything you want. Uh, superintendent's update. So um, I have mostly um, positive things, but actually going to start with a hard thing that was shared with the larger community. Um, so Ryan Moriarty, who's a high school graduate of the class of 2002 uh, and went to Crocker Farm in the middle school and is the son of two prominent educators uh, in our district, longtime educators in our district, passed away last weekend. Um, We've been providing significant amounts of support for uh, primarily for the staff members at the middle school and high school levels, but I just wondered if we could have a moment of silence um, to recognize uh, a former graduate and someone who was part of our community um, and his passing. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, a couple other items I want to share, and I know it's late, but um, there's a lot of stuff going on this, this time of year, and I just want to make sure the committee um, hears that. It was referenced earlier about the high school graduation. I know many of you were able to come, and uh, what an enjoyable event that is. Um, we did live stream it again this year. Uh, this year we had over 600 views, because we get an analytics report, which is significantly more than last year. Um, and by the end of the week, the graduation, uh, the other advantage of live streaming is we have high quality HD video or something like that. Jerry was trying to explain to me what it is better than HD um, that we'll have accessible for the larger community as well so that people can have that as a memento for their graduation and not the handheld kind of thing that perhaps some of us are, uh, had experienced in, in, uh, in our families, um, but we'll have that out by the end of the week. If not for the glitch today, I think we would have had it done today. <coughs> Power. Uh, Summit's graduation was on May 31st, a wonderfully personal personal celebration. Thank you, Mr. McJima, was able to come to his tail end and connect with families and mm -hmm. students. And um, just, you know, uh, for four graduates, it was not much different amount of time than for the high school, um, but we got to, for those people who were able to attend, you knew the graduates at the end of that ceremony, even if you'd never met them before, and you also got a sense of the community that Summit has. Um, Last night, we had our employee recognition event. We had 90 uh, people there. Um, so this is for the Clerical Media Award winners that were announced, uh, voted earlier. Uh, and then members, uh, years of service, uh, staff members across the districts, uh, 15, 20, 25, and 30. Uh, and a significant number of retirees this year, just the way it, it shook out. There was a lot of retirees. Wonderfully positive event. Um, you know, uh, one of the benefits of having worked in the district a while is I know a lot of people pretty pretty well, and as those of you who were there heard, and lots of personal stories to share, uh, engagement and otherwise, um, but for another day in, in this public meeting. Um, but uh, just really a, a wonderful time and something that we struggle to do uh, often enough and well enough is, is recognize the incredible employees we have in the district. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to do that in a formalized way. And Ms. Westmoreland's not here, but uh, as I said last night, she is by far the brains of the operation. So I get up and, and do quite a bit of talking, but it only works because of Ms. Westmoreland's organizing invitations, setting up uh, and creating the event. And the retirees get um, these beautiful, which we just had one tell me on, on, during the break. Um, wonderful bowls that our students make as a memento of their, their work for the districts. Um, we had all three districts represented. Um, we had website focus groups met yesterday, and so that feedback is being gathered. Ms. Figaro, who's here tonight, uh, met with those groups, and it's really incredibly helpful to get going for July 1st, particularly the district site. The, the school sites are going to be a little slower to come along uh, over the summer, but um, really, really helpful feedback around navigation, color scheme, uh, layout. Um, so appreciate the community coming in for that. This Friday night, uh, there's a Cambodian mural unveiling uh, here at the high school. So this has been a community-wide effort um, by community, not just the school community, but the larger com uh, Khmer community in, in, the, in living locally um, to work on this mural. And the unveiling is at 6 o'clock. 
Uh, there's monks coming. I mean, lots of people in the community coming out for it, juxtaposed with the middle school social. So it'll be a very uh, interesting constellation of events uh, happening all on this central corridor uh, Friday. But anyone here is welcome at 6 o'clock, um, and I'll definitely be there. And it's family. You know, if kids want to come, it's, it's certainly appropriate to have uh, whoever wants to come to be here. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is uh, a week ago today, uh, I attended the um, last RIAC meeting, the Racial Imbalance Advisory um, Council, uh, and it was actually a pretty neat one because it was at um, DESE in Malden, and in the meeting was the RIAC members, the Commissioner of Education, and two other senior DESE Associate Commissioners. Um, and we really had four key areas of dialogue. One was a request we had to develop an Office of Equity and Diversity at DESE. There used to be one, there hasn't been for some time, and you know, we, we had good active conversations with the commissioner. I won't, you know, it was a private meeting, so I'm not gonna go further than that. Uh, but I got a strong sense from the commissioner that he sees uh, emphasizing equity and diversity at DESE as one of his priorities. I think that I feel comfortable sharing. The second was about closing the opportunity achievement gap for marginalized students, and where does that fit in the priority of, of the, uh, the organization? We talked, uh, which is kind of related to a topic here in some ways, uh, talked earlier, but enhanced diversity in staffing both um, at SE but also in the Commonwealth's public schools and how could that be a partnership between local districts and statewide policy and procedure uh, okay. around that. And uh, and the last thing was um, about licensure actually, so also related to a conversation. Um, over 40 states use something called the Praxis, to, which is a licensure test, where one of, uh, relatively minority, small minority of states that have our own testing system called the MTEL. What, what we find here locally and what RIAC feels is that it's a barrier uh, to attract teachers from other states because the way the practice works is each state sets its own bar. Um, so, you know, Louisiana might be 220, I'm making up these numbers, 220, and uh, Connecticut might be 214, but that way the, the reciprocity works much smoother and Massachusetts is an additional barrier for um, folks and frankly some of the waivers we applied for is directly because of this barrier um, so we had a good conversation with that with the commissioner and their staff as well um, not that we got to resolution but you're trying to advocate if we're serious about goal th three enhancing diversity what are some current barriers that are getting in the way of that both at SE and, and the districts so we met for over an hour um, it was highly productive and uh, our next meeting is in the fall in September and we're actually going to host which is nice because it's a it's a 495 inward uh, centric group, uh, which is not surprising given the population of the state. And um, actually, SE staff is going to come out and meet with us again uh, in September in Amherst. So if there's opportunities for school members to be connected to that, um, I will try to find that out. But um, it was a nice way to end the year with the, the RIAC, which I find to be a highly productive and functional and uh, group that I learn a tremendous amount from them every time I'm with them. So that's my update. Any questions? I've got so, Do you know when the underclass <coughs> award ceremony for the high school is? I do not. Okay. Uh, off the top of my head, but I can talk to Mr. Jackson in the morning and let you know. Thank you. Great. Anything uh, else? Okay. Say <coughs> nothing. Um, <coughs> I think I said my report earlier. Um, we've actually had, um, I would argue <coughs> that we've had a lot of challenges and. Um, Organizing the agenda, one of the chair's jobs, organizing the agenda and organizing the agenda of the superintendent because of the complexity of topics that have been raised before um, us as a committee. Uh, and so, um, and thinking about actually another duty of the chair is to speak on behalf of the committee. Um, it, uh, it's, been, it's been very, very challenging to do that uh, in, an, in an environment in which a lot of the things that have come up have been. Um, Kind of shotgunned all over the place, and I I'm, I uh, I say that out loud just because um, I'm, I welcome uh, either in a meeting, future meeting, or retreat, or anything else, um, any ideas that we can have to continue to try to. I, I don't I don't particularly think the committee's done anything wrong or that I've done anything wrong on this, but I think as I tried to echo mm -hmm. earlier or say earlier, and I'm not going now. Um, a lot of the work we're doing still ends up being evolutionary as a group, and we are developmental as a group. And so I think things we can do as we get through talking about retreat to organize our work and structure it in ways that, um, you know, give us confidence, but also I think give the public confidence and transparency around 
power conducting you know, oversight and policy development and other activities of the committee, I think are, are welcome. I've said actually, I'm realizing now, looking back on it, when I, when I originally became chair, I started talking with uh, Mike back before he was permanent superintendent about looking at the calendar of the year and trying to see to identify topics that we should be covering. Um, either, you know, we knowing the hot season of the budget, when you know there's going to be certain topics that are going to absorb all the agenda, how do we use September and October usefully uh, or other months usefully so that we can cover topics um, that should be discussed publicly, should get some sort of rigorous public display, or in, like the libraries, just even highlight things we're doing and give an opportunity for public conversation of them. So I say that because it is related to structuring the agenda, but also I think it is both directly and indirectly, quite frankly, related to a question about how we organize our work in a way that um, uh, if something comes up that's really challenging, um, the public even more clearly sees that, that whatever that topic is or challenge contextualize within a body of work that we can find ways to be very transparent about as a group. So I throw that out because um, uh, uh, as, as pleased as I am to be chair again for you for another year, um, I found the last few weeks to be actually um, very challenging in terms of figuring out how to organize our work effectively and, and pre represent that work, at least then I was doing so. Do you have agenda? It's a non sequitur, so I don't know if anyone had a response to that. I wanna... So, are you talking specifically about how to communicate to the public, how the school committee can communicate to the public in a more timely fashion? Or are you talking generally on, like, about a lot of No, actually, I, I, was, I really wasn't that. I actually was talking about, um, you know, and this again is a good retreat topic, and I know that's on the agenda, is thinking about how we structure our work and structure. Um, different responsibilities of the committee, but also different activities of the district, and look at the calendar and look at how we, like like uh, Ms. Kosinski's request that sometime in the fall we have on the agenda the topic of licensure. You could probably blow that out. I mean, you also mentioned diversity. You could blow out blow out to an entire saying that we should have a meeting about HR topics, and in them we can structure a number of topics that we'd have in it. I think we already do a good job around budget, although that was intentional, right? We actually had a lot of meetings where we talked about how should we structure our budget conversation. And so that one's a lot better than it used to be. And I think there are other things we can do like that across the range of topics that come up as a district. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, just not to make a joke out of it, I'm not trying to eliminate the role of the chair in helping to develop the agenda by so heavily structuring our work that we know in June what we're gonna talk about in November. But I do, I do actually think that it goes into the question of how the committee does, but also is seen as conducting its work in relationship to the work of the, of the administration and of the district. And we should, we should try to be, I think, increasingly intentional about that. So that's the answer to that. So I just, I left one important thing out of the update, oh. which is that, um, and we announced this last week, but I have an additional piece of information. So Sasha Palmer was hired as a new food service director, and we're very fortunate that she's able to start before July 1st so that she has a fair bit of crossover time with Ryan Harb um, because those are really big, important. That is a big, important job, and um, my opinion, Ryan's done an outstanding, outstanding work this year, and so that there's um, transition time for both of them as Ryan's exiting and Sasha's coming in. Um, so I just wanted to update the committee on that. And I met with third graders at Fort River today who have lots to share about uh, utensils and whether we should be throwing them out. And she, those, she's going to get a letter right away on her first day on the job. <laughs> Ms. Adonis <laughs> and Mr. Sullivan. Um, I was just wondering, well, I'm going to the mic right now, um, when you would get a chance to meet Ms. Palmer. So given that she's starting as soon as, as early as at some point next week, uh, we could try to figure whether that's the late June meeting or whether that's coming back in the fall. Um, I don't know ex I don't know if she's working, I don't have all the details of exactly how much she's working in the month of June, I just know that she's making it work to have some crossover with Mr. Harb. Um, but we can try to work on that. Yeah, I've just heard a lot of feedback from the community that they've heard the rumors. Yes. And so there's a lot of eagerness to hear what her ideas are. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I think if, when we can fit it in, it would be great. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sullivan, then Ms. So I just want to piggyback on Dr. Morris. Um, when Before Mr. Harb started, we had one site for a free lunch during the summertime. And then last year he increased it to four, and I had a conversation with him in late May. And even though he's leaving, 
that we're going to have 10 sites for free lunch this year. Awesome. Yeah, it's grant to support it as well. Oh, you didn't yes. have it. I'm no, sorry. No, I, no, I was okay. read too much into eye contact. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and isn't there, isn't there a, a free breakfast thing that's being launched? Uh, the, for our summer school programs, yeah, we, we typically, you know, in the past just had sort of dry cereal, things like that, but we're, we're making a real breakfast uh, for the students who come to summer school programming. Yeah, and Ryan, I don't know if you heard about this, Michelle, but Ryan had, uh, i say the coolest idea, but I think, I don't know if it's totally unique, because uh, it's also federally funded, <laughs> on, on how to, so probably it's totally unique, um, on how to um, provide lunch for every student in their classroom. So when they come to school, I mean, they'd be breakfast. provided. Breakfast breakfast oh, breakfast. I said breakfast lunch, I'm sorry, I meant breakfast. Yeah. I'm sorry, I meant breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, which is, I think, tremendous. And uh, there's, a pl there's a plan to start rolling that out that we can hopefully hear about. So, boy. Cool. Anything else? Uh, great. So public comment policy and practice discussion. Um, we should probably see how far we can get with that now and what extent mm -hmm. we want to identify this as a future topic. Well, Ms. Uh, yes? I was thinking um, we don't have a policy subcommittee right now, right? That's an agenda item. But I would think that that would be some of the first work would be to review the policy and come back with a recommendation while in the meantime we do whatever it is we're going to do. That sounds sensible. <laughs> um, and just to, because I was one of the ones, I don't know if other people asked for yeah. this agenda item. Yeah. So I, th I think I um, totally agree on um, taking this to the, in light of the legal um, natic situation, um, re looking at our own policy. But I think also I mean, we, we had sort of intermittent conversations and some of the things that we, that you in, um, instituted tonight are, mm -hmm. Um, practices around even existing policy that I think um, were really productive. I don't know how others felt, but I, I thought the timer was really helpful as people were very aware of, of their time and were respectful yeah. of that and didn't put you in the hot seat of having to um, sort of call out on the time. So I, um, and I, I do think that maybe if we are going to be readdressing the policy, that maybe more conversation around the practice would be better after we have um, any evolved uh, policy change. Um, maybe Ms. Ruth. I kept calling her and her all the time, so yeah. I'd look this direction. <laughs> so I'm now going to call on you. Um, first thing. Yeah, I thought. I thought. Um, what went particularly well about the public comment tonight was the fact that I think it was easier to adhere to the three-minute time limit because there was a perception that um, we weren't making rulings, right, on what was being s said. And I think that um, went well. So my so going forward, my question is because, you know, I do, I do think it's important to have time limits so that we can get our business done, um, but it's also important to hear from the community. Um, I One question I have, so I think it was definitely the right approach to take a more conservative um, stance towards First Amendment issues. Um, I might like to hear a little bit more from a legal perspective about how those things mesh with privacy laws, because mm -hmm. I don't know if the memo got into that too much. Um, so, I mean, I Shaking think... Shaking my head, no. I should say it out loud. <laughs> no, it did not. Um, my sense is that constitutional issues would take precedence, but I would like to maybe have a more fleshed out understanding, so that might be something that this policy subcommittee would look into more, or... Hey, can I just jump in one second before I move here? So, um, the reason why I, why I was recommending to the committee taking a more cautious, I think called prudential, more prudent approach, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I used a synonym, um, was actually precisely because the, the, the injunction that was um, handed down by Superior Court in Nata, uh, for Natick, and also the, the memo or the advice we got from Mark Terry, both of them were equally, in my sort of, my, I'm not criticizing anyone, but in my mind sort of maddeningly unhelpful in reasoning through why you, why you would have a decision that repeatedly prioritizes First Amendment or Massachusetts Constitution free speech rights in an, really absolutely, saying, look, if something's going to 
you're not going to restrain someone from speaking. You're not going to interrupt them. You can't just sit there and make judgments about the content of someone's speech. Like over and over again, the decision referred to that. And then at the end, sort of out of, out of nothing, it then said, well, because of privacy concerns, um, you can still restrain people from using names. And I read that, and I thought to myself, that, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but that, like, doesn't, considering everything else was extremely well explained, like, that, that isn't really good enough for me, especially when I think what it invites is um, another lawsuit where someone says, hmm, I think I want to investigate or evaluate this point more thoroughly. And I just wasn't comfortable with that. So the answer is no, we didn't get a good explanation of it. And I'd, I'd love to get, I think it part of, the, part of the work of the policy subcommittee, I think it'd be great if they engaged with Mark Terry or others further to get more information. Um, Mr. Donia is not Mr. Dunman. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I had been eager for this also to be on the agenda. And given the recent events, um, you know, I think as both Mr. Nakajima and, and previous chairs have experienced when, um, and you know, I would say the superintendent as well, and previous superintendents, when uh, topics get really heated, it is difficult to figure out the right balance to keep between hearing people's frustration and, you know, and, and, and um, expressions of, of concern versus the sometimes, uh, you know, sort of what could appear uh, accusations that are, that are not necessarily based on evidence, right? It's just, you know, sort of people saying what they've heard, not necessarily what they know to be true. And there's a lot of that, right? There's, you know, there's people share information, various networks, you know, and, and so I do feel that there is a responsibility that we have to maintain a certain amount of, of uh, not just free speech, but also safe space for staff and administrators and what have you, everyone that's working and, and being in this environment, so that you're not just being sort of excoriated publicly and your name is, you know, is, is sort of being dragged through the mud when we know that there's not any proof of that, right? Like, the, you know, and this has happened to various degrees in various ways. And so that's always a tension, I think, that exists, is that we want to allow for people to be able to express their opinions and express their frustrations and let us know what they're thinking. I want to hear that. But I also don't want to hear people making accusations and naming people when I, I don't know if what they're saying is true. And, and no one else is going to be able to pick that out from you know, a YouTube video or you know, a clip that appears in the paper. And so I feel like you know, any conversation, whether it's the policy subcommittee and or us having that conversation, that we have to find, we have to figure out what that balance is. You know, that said, and I said this before to the chair, I think that the Natick uh, decision definitely muddies the waters a whole lot more because you know, it's, it, it is a court that is making a decision about a very specific case, and the details in that case are not exactly in alignment with our situation here. And I want to make sure that anyone that's still watching or anything like that, that this, this particular case has you know, a different set of details that are different from ours and may be judged for those details differently than the way that anything that we would ever you know, experience here. Um, and that said, Natick is also sort of an initial decision. There's other uh, yeah. cases that are wending their way through legal systems in other states. And we don't know what those findings will be in those different circuits and all of that. So there's a lot of stuff happening right now. And I think rightly so, it matches the zeitgeist of where we are in our society, where people are questioning things that we've sort of done by practice previously, wanting to know, is this right? Is this just? You know, do we have the right answer? Should we keep asking the question? I think we should keep asking the question. But I want to make sure, again, that we're creating a safe space for people, because simultaneous to the need for the public to express their opinion, I also believe that we have, that our educators and administrators and staff have the right to come to a meeting and not be lambasted unfairly. And I have sat through specific meetings in the past couple of years where, you know, staff who were not even expected to be in public positions were publicly humiliated and attacked personally and no one came to their defense. And I swore that I would never allow that to happen again. I don't think that that is our position to just sit back and allow something like that to happen in a public forum. It's not fair, it's not right, it's not just. And so I do wanna make sure that any conversations that we have 
around these policies, take that into consideration and create a better environment for everybody and that we can try to come up with some you know, resolutions that account for the different perspectives but that don't destroy people and you know, have them. And I, know, I also wanted to say too, and I know we're not at the retreat planning yet, but I do think that when we get to that conversation, when we get to that planning stage, um, I do want to have a conversation about how to bring in tools that help all of us sort of manage some of these difficult conversations better. Because there are trainers who specialize in that kind of thing, right? And it is a very stressful situation to be in. And you know, people's perspectives and opinions about why that's stressful can vary. Um, and there's accusations that have been lobbed against you know, what, what those might, reasons might be. Regardless, they are difficult conversations, they are stressful conversations, they have a lasting impact on everyone. And so I think in order for us to be better public elected officials, we have to also have those tools to be able to manage those kinds of conversations and know what to do when faced with that kind of anger and, and charged environment. Um, so anyway, I just you know, wanted to say that, that I think it's, it's you know, really, really important that we, as we move forward, that we consider all these different pieces um, and that the policy subcommittee whoever they may be in the future, um, <laughs> are not just looking at the policy, the letter of the law, you know, so to speak, but that they're also considering all these other aspects of it, right? And so I hope that this, the policy subcommittee can have conversations with the superintendent, can have conversations mm -hmm. with the school committee members to the degree possible, um, and with our attorneys, and, you know, do a little research on this. Not that they don't usually, but this, I feel, has a certain um, longevity and impact that carries beyond just a typical policy subcommittee, so... So I would echo a lot of the themes that Mr. Jonia has brought up um, in terms of us being in this zeitgeist where all of a sudden all of our norms of civil behavior are all of a sudden up for question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everybody that our public comment went uh, better tonight. Um, I think a lot of that is because people were more well behaved, <laughs> frankly, um, and didn't, even though they, they could have crossed the lines into paragraphs three or six, uh, defamatory abuse of remarks or reference to name or position, they for the most part didn't. Um, I do think the timer helped, although just speaking from somebody who did a lot of public comment before I was on school committee, we have to find some way to make that timer look a lot less intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is funny, but at the other, it is pretty intimidating to go up here, especially in that kind of environment, do public comment, to have this massive timer, the thousandth of the second <laughs> running down on you, does not help. So I'm sure that's a 20 minutes Google search, but we can find something like that. Um, more of the issue, though, I think is, um, it, it, some of the examples Mr. Bardoni has brought up, and, and I, would, I guess I would remind, remind the committee that, um, you know, so we have a policy, we have things that are explicitly excluded in paragraph 6 about reference to name or position, and then we have a, a, a recent uh, um, ruling that specifically supports that, and then we have a, our own attorney's interpretation of that ruling that specifically supports that. Now I realize that that's not perfect, but that's the kind of state we're in. And so, while I have no problem with how we conservatively opened up the First Amendment book tonight, um, I don't feel any more settled in terms of how we should go forward. I, th I think we kind of got away with how polite people were, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. I think if somebody came in for three minutes and just personally attacked, humiliated uh, a teacher who could not defend herself in an in-depth, detailed, completely false manner, we would maybe feel a little differently. And so. This is no criticism, by the way, of the chair. I think I have a lot of um, empathy for the sympathy, I should say, because I'm not in that position, not empathy, for um, uh, having to have the responsibility to um, make those rulings. Um, so I, I, I have no problem with, with what we did tonight, but I, I do think um, that it is, it, is a, it is a big open question in terms of what, what we want to open ourselves up to. You know, well, one thing I, oh, sorry, I guess I, I just had a, a so to me, there's a little bit of a difference in um, criticizing in public a teacher or a student or somebody in our district um, that I would, you know, just from a professionalism perspective, want to protect that from occurring. Um, I want employees to feel protected and, and welcome in this school and not be worried that a decision they make in a classroom will play itself out in in the in a public meeting, right? I think that's a reasonable expectation, and I think the public in general would agree with with that sort of level of constraint. Um, 
I guess, you know, I think the sticky point always is when you get with a superintendent, right? So if you have a, a complaint about a teacher, and we've seen a few emails where uh, parents are advocating for their children and we get pulled in, um, you know, we always direct them to, you need to, f you know, follow this policy on how to, you know, how to file a complaint, please speak to the superintendent, you know, and for the most part, unless, you know, if they go through that whole process and are not felt that they are been heard, there is a way to come back to us. Um, I th so I think all of that is really well played out, and, and I think if you can explain that to the public in advance, that, you know, these are the kind of situations for everybody's privacy should be handled in another way. I think the sticky point is always with the superintendent, right, because the policy says, go through the wickets up to the superintendent with a complaint. But if your complaint is with the superintendent, it's much more challenging. And so I think um, what might be a benefit in addition to, you know, working on whatever language we settle on for this policy is being really clear on when you have an issue with the superintendent or a decision that was made or something. What What is the appropriate process? And maybe it's in public, but how can we... Mm -hmm develop a policy that allows that discussion to happen in a, in a constructive way where we can all move forward um, and public, you know, the public has an opportunity to have their voice heard. Um, and I think that's where the sticky wicket has always been. And I think our policy probably is not very informative to the public on, on what should happen. I think, that makes a lot, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it brings a lot of clarity. Um, because I think a lot of the issue is around how you complain about something, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are being, you know, obviously, whenever we have people just coming up and saying what they care about, sort of generically, that isn't really the issue, right? right? The issue is when somebody has a complaint, and the more specific the complaint, or the more pointed the complaint, the more challenging it is. So I think, to, I think actually developing, this probably is a separate policy than actually the public comment policy, but, but elaborating or looking at more closely how we guide the public in submitting complaints of different sorts, including up to the level of the superintendent. Um, and then how are there more constructive ways that we could do, we could help facilitate that dialogue, especially when it's the level of the superintendent, I think would be probably very helpful for us to do. I also think we, and this is something that Ms. Kastensen was saying earlier, um, we just need to get a lot more clarity around how we're guided legally. I know, so there's two issues. One, one question to me, and I think it's a good one, is can we in innovate or change how we engage in interacting with the public around their input? So to me, when that there could be things we could learn in terms of techniques and any number of things we could learn to improve through that. One though, because also it could be literally changing the structure of how we receive that input. So the idea that we have, a, you know, a rather formal cattle call, whether it's a huge clock or, or smaller clock, and people have come up to a microphone. <laughs> and they have three minutes, and they have the three minutes to talk, and it's early at the beginning of the meeting, and then boom, they're done. That's only one way to receive input. There are probably other ways we could think of, including that would have a public nature to it. So it's not just saying, you know, we could send an email that we're not sure, you're not sure anyone will ever read. I mean, there's probably different ways we should be looking at to structure public comment that I think would be helpful. But on the, on the legal side, I, I just feel personally like I need to get a lot more clarity around getting guidance um, as I said, the letter from Mark Terry set the, in the injunction both certainly said you could um, uh, prevent people from naming names or positions, but it provided absolutely no legal justification for why that was why that was appropriate or under what circumstances that are appropriate. And that was such a flimsy justification for imposing that rule that it didn't it, it doesn't make me comfortable now. But I'm saying it's not going to be comfortable in September either, unless we get more information and guidance on that. And, and including, by the way, if I'm still, I'll stop in two seconds. Yeah, it, it, particularly also, if there's, if if in fact, once you dig into it, you in fact can legally justify and differentiate between different um, roles within the district, different categories of members of our community, different kinds of staff people, certainly students or families or whatever. I think any kind of guidance we can get on that is actually helpful. It's helpful for us. It's also helpful to the public so that they can understand why we would impose limits on speech if we're doing 
I, I mean, I agree fully that the fact that people are being potentially rude or abusive to the public wheel or you know, our common wheel is, is a bad thing. But unfortunately, you know, we all know our laws aren't always structured based on ideal behavior. They're based on sort of minimum standards of what you can legally do. So anyways, Ms. McDonald. Um, I, I, um, just I agree with uh, most of the comments that I've been hearing. One of the things that I, um, that struck me both in reading the Natick opinion but also other previous opinions in other states is this concept not just of privacy and freedom of speech but content neutral um, and, and sort of position neutrality. And what, when it, our, our policy right now is really focused on negative and critical comments and that's where we're, our conversation is really focusing right now. Mm -hmm. But when we have that sort of statement and we're, when we're devising our policy around negative comments, we have to be aware that we should be um, applying that same standard for positive statements, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about saying it's okay to praise individuals and praise things, that our policy, because right now our policy only prohibits mm -hmm. criticism <laughs> um, and naming individuals, but I, but I do feel that even if we continue on that path, we need to be very clear that it doesn't matter whether you're praising somebody or criticizing somebody, the naming of names and um, and sort of um, airing of sort of more of those personal experiences is not appropriate in this this kind of public mm -hmm. situation because that's putting us in the position of judging whether what they're saying what the public is is bringing to us is a complaint or a po or a praise and mm -hmm. and I think we that's what we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So. At a very base level, it's not as nearly as esteemed as those comments. Uh, about five minutes from now, we need to depart so that the custodians can clean up. Sorry for the. Moving right along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was encouraged to be blunt earlier. So. Um. <laughs> uh, all right. So retreat planning. Um, we've talked about a couple things that have, I forget whether I, I can't remember what we've talked about or whatever you tell, tell me you want to do. Um, go ahead. I was going to suggest maybe, um, you know, if, if you set a deadline, yeah. uh, we can set ourselves a deadline for submitting mm. ideas for the retreat. Because, I, you know, I know I've got a ton of stuff. I've sent yeah. a bunch of stuff on. But, you know, maybe just like saying, like, this is for the retreat. Can we think about how we incorporate this? I think know? ideally between now and the next meeting, we would yeah. people would get in ideas or topics they want to cover. I was just, I was, the comment I was going to make is, I think Anastasia had the idea of having a facilitator come in, um, which is great for a lot of reasons. I mean, not just so I'm not facilitating. It's also good just because if they're really good, then they can facilitate, they can improve the quality of the conversation we have and the, and the capture of things. Spitzer? I would also say it would be really helpful if we could get it on the calendar soon, just as all of us have vacations, child care obligations, all of that. Yeah, I actually. I don't know if a doodle is. No, no, I really wanted to get a doodle pull out already. Yeah. I, I thought we just said we wanted one. But can you can I'll you guys sure. take that back to the office yep. and make sure we get a doodle pull out and and a request for topics? We'll do both. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You. yeah. And I think uh, a request for topics would fall under agenda structuring and would not be open meeting law prohibitive. Like we could actually send an email to everybody to say, "I was thinking of these topics." You can. I think as long as you're really. I mean, again, I think you have you have. You can't have two paragraphs after that explaining all why? the reasons you can't why. Write. No why. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has to literally just be the topics. Okay. Can it be topics and desired outcome? No. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like the, I don't mean like a decision. Um, it, it, it's a terminology that we use a lot at work where we're saying oh like, deliverables. Why we're, what deliverables do de exactly. you get out of something? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you get a list of deliverables. Uh, Sullivan, you? No, I'll hold it to next. You just time. look like you had something on your I, mind. I'm gonna. I'll save it for next time. Okay. My uh, memory's not that good. Anything else? Okay. We seeing. Have gifts. We have gifts. Oh, gifts! Darn. There you yeah. go. Really nice one. It's not in here though. It's, it's, not in the it's a separate piece of paper separate that I should have been in front of you. Get that one. Yeah. Well. Um, 
Somebody who has it in front of them, want to start? I'll move to accept the gifts as follows. Northampton Elks to support the 2018 high school scholarship in the amount of $500. Pelham Elementary PTO to support the 2018 high school scholarships in the amount of $500. Anonymous ARHS faculty and staff and citizens of Amherst to support 2018 Lijun scholarship in the amount of $2,560. Stop and shop rewards. $5,000 to the high school principal's discretion fund and $6,500 to the high school PGO gift fund for a total of $11,560.52. Uh, from I guess that's from Stop and Shop. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, so the grand total is $15,120.52. Is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor accepted any gifts as reds? We aye. aye. Uh, it is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Anyone have a further motion? Move to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Second. second. So moved and second. Any for no, no comments allowed. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Um, no comments allowed. Adjourned. No.